Okay, everyone. Well, we're very lucky today to have uh, Richard Easter here with us. Richard is a scientist, teacher, and communicator. He has been a professor of physics at the University of Auckland for over the last 10 years and was previously a professor of physics at Yale University. Uh, as a scientist, Richard covers ground that crosses particle physics, cosmology, astrophysics, and astronomy. And in particular, he focuses on the physics of the very early universe and the ways in which the universe changes between the Big Bang and the present day. Welcome, Richard. How are you doing today? Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> things are good. Yeah. Um, well, today's topic's very special because it's it's outside my wheelhouse, but it's, of course, uh, going to be a topic that is on the mind of basically every curious person that's grown up, which is how did the universe arise, right? What, what, what is all this stuff about the Big Bang, the universe expanding, all these sorts of things that the lay person has certainly heard, but uh, unless you're a, a specialist, you've never really gotten to dive into it. And e including myself, you know, as a, as a trained mathematician and scientist, I, I've, you know, there's just only so many things you can uh, get an education in. And I, I haven't gone through the details of cosmology. And so it's really exciting to, uh, to talk to, to you today about, about oh, those topics. I'm happy to do that. One of, one of the cool things about working, or one of the interesting things about working on cosmology is, you know, it's often, you know, it's, it's sort of, I guess, presented as our, you know, society's equivalent of a creation story or, you know, an, an origin story. So everyone's got one. Um, and, and I guess the surprising thing about it is that, is that on the one hand, everyone's got one, but, you know, and so, so this is ours. Um, but on the other hand, you know, a surprisingly small number of people have been, you know, are able to make, contact with it in the you know in the original I guess um, and so so people when they hear about it they tend to hear about it in translation or in some you know allegorical version and so you know the, the you know the books are open to everybody but but the process of making that walk um, you know is one of the pleasures I guess of being a you know, physics student um, but also I feel like you know it's the I mean the number of people who actually work on theoretical cosmology is not huge um, you know, in terms of people who actually you know, use it to pay their mortgage and feed their kids or whatever. But, um, you know, a surprising number of those people have a kind of sideline as the communicator. And so, you know, it's much more common in my field for a colleague to have, you know, a book out or to be on TV or something like that. It's a, it seems to come with the territory, but it's, yeah, it's part of the pleasure of, you know, going and looking and then, you know, <laughs> sort of this, this is what we've seen when we climb the mountain. Like. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's, it's the topic of universal wonder. I mean, it's something I would, Astronomy must have been one of the earliest sciences, if if, if not the earliest, uh, you know, how, how science broadly construed. Yeah, I mean, right? yeah, science for engineering. I mean, material science, you know, being able to, to turn things you find in the environment into things that didn't previously exist. I mean, it's definitely something that human beings have been doing for maybe the thick end of a million years. But I think, you know, one of the things, too, is, is that, you know, we lose contact with the natural sky in some sense as, as you know, as beings that primarily live in cities. Um, and so, you know, in New Zealand, one of the nice things about living in New Zealand is you don't have to get too far out of town to have really dark, dark night, you know, and you sit outside and you, you see the Milky Way and then, you know, you realize that, that, you know, a thousand years ago, um, or, you know, even hundreds of years ago, that was everyone's birthright in some sense, the ability to see and experience that. And that connects you to a lineage that stretches back pretty much probably to the point where people were able to talk. Um, you know, you build a fire and then you step a little bit away from the fire and you wait for your eyes to adapt and, and, and you're, you know, you're seeing a sky that looks very much like um, the one that we see today when we're given the chance. And so, yeah, it definitely connects us with some, you know, a long, you know, preoccupation of the human species. Yeah. Um, before we dive in, I, I just thought we'd uh, explain to our audience how we met, which is actually a bit funny. So, so almost exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, almost exactly a year ago. Um, uh, a, a man by the name of Eric Weinstein released his approach at a, a theory of everything uh, called Geometric Unity, or GU for short, and a Vice article came out, uh, and we were the two uh, scientists cited in that article uh, for having critical remarks about his theory, and then uh, we both connected on Twitter. Uh, but I actually never asked you how you got involved with the critique. I, I don't know if you want to explain here how, how you got involved. It's a critique i mean it wasn't so much weinstein that i was critiquing it was really um i, I guess as an someone he, he's i mean he's an interesting guy i think you know he's he has a phd in math from harvard according to the internet so you know he's clearly someone who has some some sophistication and and someone you know he paints himself as an outsider but 
you know, to my way of thinking of PhD and Matt from Harvard, you know, makes you the consummate insider. Um, so, you know, a, you know, you know, on one hand, you've had this very enormously privileged academic life. You know, people, a lot of people would give a limb to have the opportunities that he's had. And then on the other hand, he's, you know, he has this kind of poor me story about how people beat up on him. Um, but no, the thing that irritated me is that there was a thing in the Guardian about how he was, you know, going to make this first big challenge to Einstein in a hundred years or something. I can't, I can't remember the exact language, and it was, it was the person responsible for it was a British mathematician um, and science popular. It's a, you know, he's had a bunch of books, and I think he's he's relatively well known in the UK. Uh, Marcus de Sotoy, and he was saying you know, he had this brilliant set of ideas. And I looked at it and I thought, A, people you know, challenge Einstein every day. You know, it's a boring day at work if I have a, you know, if, if someone like me, if, you know, if we haven't thought, the, you know, like maybe, maybe he's wrong, but, you know, a hundred years have gone by and thousands of people have been looking at it. And no one's actually figured out what the, you know, there are, you know, very, there's no obvious crack in general relativity that resembles, say, you know, the perihelion precession of Mercury. You know, it's very, it's very hard to put your finger on a, um, there are certainly things that GR is silent about, you know, what really happens at a singularity or what happens when we merge quantum mechanics and, and, um, and you know, black holes, for instance. But there's, you know, it's very hard to say, you know, GR has kind of faced some test and, you know, come up, you know, come up wanting. And so I was like, you know, firstly, this isn't true. And secondly, you know, people do this all the time. And every time they do it, pretty much they've been wrong. So why does this guy get into the newspaper? And so I dug into it a little bit and I wrote a grumpy blog about it. And kind of left it at that. Um, but, you know, there's nothing like something making you grumpy to want to write a blog about it. And, and, and I have a blog, so I wrote it. And I think it got picked up by a couple of people who comment on these things at the time. I remember uh, maybe a piece, a couple of pieces, maybe one in Scientific American and somewhere else that sort of, you know, quoted me or just lifted you know a sentence or two from what i'd written and and so then i sort of forgot about it and, and then this sort of reappeared with kind of a hiss and a roar you know that 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 he was going to you know like be kind enough to explain everything i mean and it's a kind of i guess a weird social phenomenon as well you know that that he then sort of turned this kind of notoriety that he generated for himself to be you know to proclaim himself the captain of the intellectual dark web <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of a, it's kind of a baller move um, to, to pull that off, I guess. Um, but yeah, I've always, I've always thought that there was, I mean, his real skill seems to be to persuade serious people to take him seriously. Um, when, you know, I mean, I get probably at least one crackpot email a week claiming to have a theory of everything, and his one is, you know, he's not strictly speaking a crackpot because you know it is couched in, in technical language. And I guess you did the field this huge service by actually having the skills and the time and the willingness to dig into it. And so most, you know, most people look at something that's wrong and they say, oh, it look, looks wrong. And they say, it looks wrong. I'm not going to waste my time on that. Um, but because, you know, you're not responding or you don't need to respond to the promptings of the, you know, of the, of the kind of, I guess, the, the professional structure that we live inside. Um, because you know you've chosen to chosen a different career path you, you you have the skills and the time and the inclination to do something about it so you, you did us all a huge solid by actually <laughs> trying to pass what he'd done and then, and then you know commenting critically on it which you know which in fairness nobody else had kind of committed the time to but on the other hand he he hadn't um necessarily persuaded people to commit that time and it's and you know it's very much an information economy i think in science you know if you want the attention of your colleagues you have to package your work in a way that's, that's as accessible and as easy for them to understand. And the more you talk about how, you know, mysterious what you've done is or how different it is, or, you know, accentuate the differences rather than provide people a, a ladder to walk across, then the less likely it is that you're going to get attention, you know, and it's probably true that, you know, this is a, you know, this is a potential problem for science, you know, like, a, you know, what happens if the person who's just turned up in my office you know, with a suitcase and a self-published book is, you know, is Ramanujan, you know, how am I, you know, we're, we're, always, we're always terrified that, that it's actually Ramanujan and, you know, that, you know, someone, someone who sort of has started completely off the grid and then suddenly appears and has done a lot of cool things. Um, it doesn't look like Weinstein is Ramanujan, um, but, you know, he has managed to, to take the possibility that he has a theory of everything and then parley that into, into you know, he has, you know, clout on reddit or you know followers on clubhouse you know and so i mean as a you know if you really thought i think that you were going to be the next einstein or the next newton you know you would go all in you would you would dig in and you would say oh, you know i'm going to work really hard on trying to run this down 
But if you've got something that just looks like you might be the next Einstein or the next Newton, but you know, you don't really back yourself, then I think, you know, then then you use it to build <laughs> to build cloud. <laughs> I think, I, you know, so from my point of view, like, I think, yeah, if, if, if Weinstein doesn't take himself seriously as a scientist, then, you know, then why should the rest of us? But, you know, he did get to give a talk at Oxford, which is more than many people would get if they walked in off the street. So, you know, I, I, I guess that I guess that was fun for him. But but I don't know. I don't know if it was so enjoyable for my colleagues at Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That, that, wow. Th thank you for that, Richard. I, uh, I, 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 I wasn't expecting quite... Uh, Quite, quite a, a a deep discussion about uh, you know your, no, your thoughts. It's on... like it's a weird thing. I mean, it's a cultural phenomenon, right? You know, he's 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 got himself, a, he's leveraged himself a huge amount of attention off the back of something that that is, you know, and he you know he'll have a hundred reasons why it's not taken seriously by people in the field, but but it isn't. Um, and and so the fact that you can take that and first get attention and then leverage the attention you the small amount of attention you got from the community and for some you know to some you know something that has i guess and some to some extent real world value it's you know obviously been been valuable to him mm. but it's, a, it's although to be it's fair he was thing. he was already famous bef i guess well before the gu release he sort of he, I mean, I guess maybe there was a, a a positive reinforcement loop, but you know, he he started his podcast, and then then the then he used that to launch his GU, which maybe reinforced his his podcast. I don't know. I but I think the Guardian thing came first, didn't it? Oh yeah, like yeah. The Guardian yeah, sure. thing was That's 2013 true. or 2014. Sure. And so I, you know, I I'm not on Reddit. I don't, um, you know, I wasn't paying a huge amount of attention to that. You know, wasn't he on Joe Rogan as well? You know, I mean, like, like you know, a lot of yeah. people again would give an answer. But, but I think, but I think it's because he, you know, he works for uh, Peter Thiel and he has uh, connections to the world of finance. I don't, I don't think GU was like the first thing on his resume. It's, it was more like a interesting fact. I mean, maybe he got him the job uh, under Peter Thiel based on some speculation that because he, he's an because like he's this outsider who <laughs> who's willing to work on theories of everything and therefore that's contrarian enough for. To, to fit Peter Thiel's bill, but, but okay, I, mean, I don't. Peter, yeah, Peter, Peter Thiel's inner workings is something that likewise is mysterious to me. Um, yeah, I think I, I mean it's definitely he was working on a theory of everything at some point in the past, and in sort of part, and he was connected to like a bunch of people, I guess, in the sort of East Coast, um, you know, who 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 do these you know salons or you know either virtual or, or real, you know, sort of a sort of pop science questions and so he definitely he definitely moves in a bunch of those circles and i think you know money money buys you access um in ways that you know probably epstein um you know illustrated how a relatively small amount of money will get you a huge amount of attention from from prominent scientists and you know he's obviously not you know i mean but the, but just the proximity to wealth um i think helps and you know once once you know some people you know other people and you can make these um you know, slightly oracular pronouncements about, you know, how everything's a game or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, suddenly, you know, if you, if you sound smart, then people, people will think you are smart and you're taken seriously by someone else. Mm. You know, so, suddenly you've got an end. But it's, it's, not, it's not entirely clear to me how that happens. It's not. I mean, he, yeah, you're right. He works for someone prominent and he has been to a prominent place and he's well-connected. So he's clearly very good at persuading people that he's a serious person, maybe less good at actually delivering on the kind of goods that you would need to, you know, to become that mm. in reality, I guess. Yeah. Anyways, uh, enough about Weinstein. That's not the main topic of our, of our interview, uh, fortunately. Uh, so, uh, so maybe I just thought maybe we should just give a very brief outline of, of what we were, were going to talk about before we, we dive in, since maybe uh, it's quite a maybe technical subject or just a lot of things, yeah, just yeah, to yeah. give a sense of sure. what we're going to uh, go over. So maybe just I, I, I broke it up into maybe four parts and tell me what you think. So uh, let me start writing here. So maybe the first part, I thought we could go over the math and physics uh, of the Big Bang, right? Because yeah. sort of qualitatively, everyone's heard of the Big Bang, but they most people just haven't even seen the equations, even though they might be, uh, you know, technically skilled enough to understand them because, you know, most engineers right, and, right. and mathematicians, you know, have been trained in, in, in differential equations. They, they could understand it. It's just never looked at it. So we're going to actually just look at the details. Um, uh, and then the second part is to go over inflation and where that, uh, why that, uh, you know, theory of inflation was needed to correct maybe some of the deficiencies of the uh, conventional theory of the Big Bang. Uh, I thought uh, another third interesting topic was to talk about 
uh, bicep two and gravitational mm -hmm. waves. Uh, and I thought that's particularly interesting. Well, first of all, uh, part of uh, uh, that experiment was indeed to try to corroborate certain theories of inflation through the detection of gravitational waves, right? So that uh, definitely picks up from the inflation thread. Uh, it's also interesting because uh, this topic of bicep two is actually the topic of Brian Keating's uh, acclaimed book, Losing the Nobel Prize. <laughs> uh, and now Brian Keating, he's a distinguished professor of physics at UC San Diego and also the most prominent supporter of GU, in fact. Brian Keating has mentioned that he <laughs> is supporting Eric's GU research through a scholar in residence at UC San Diego. So it will be interesting to that, see. That I, that I did not, that I did not know. Oh, he, he, he's mentioned that more than once. Okay, and, and yeah, so it would okay. yeah, and yeah, yeah. specifically to help Eric run experimental test for GU, whatever that means. Wow. So okay. uh, I don't know what that means either, yeah. but, but that's what, I mean, that's what he should be doing in fact. So, so this is a good thing. Yeah. So, so, um, uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah so this, I, this is, this is, this is what you do when you have an idea, you, you develop it and test it. So, so that sounds, yeah. That sounds so, so it'll be great. Positive. It'll be great to, to hear what updates we get from Brian and Eric as they go further. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah so, so anyways, so, so that's, that will be our third topic. And, uh, finally, you know, I guess just to wrap it up, we can end with say current and uh, future, uh, you know, trends in cosmology say like, where's the field and, yeah. and what's, uh, where, where are things going? Okay. So, so how does that sound as like, uh, no, a that, that sounds, that sounds good. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Cool. All right. So maybe let's just dive into it and, and get started with the, uh, uh, first topic. So, 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 I mean, the, the key thing that, that comes home for me is that, um, is that the, the idea of the big bang is something that, that happens pretty quickly once you have the idea of general relativity. And so, you know, the chronology here is, is that Einstein comes up with special relativity in 1905. And special relativity is in some ways implicit in Maxwell's equations, um, you know, which date back to the 1860s. Um, and, you know, other people have been sort of groping towards it. And so he comes up with this idea that, you know, we often express it in terms of the, um, you know, that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, or we can't, you know, catch up to a photon. But really what it means is that we all observe light traveling at the same speed, even if it's, you know, the same light, we both see it, you know, the moving observer and a stationary observer sees it propagated at the same speed in their own reference frame. And so special relativity changes the way that we think, you know, different observers map the world into the, into the reference frame that they've built. But it doesn't change. Um, but what general general relativity goes goes one step further, uh, or many steps further in some sense, and it's also a theory of gravity, and that it explains how it is that the gravitational force is communicated from one place to another, and it does that by saying that space and time, which special relativity tells us is you know really one thing, you know space time, um, is in some sense malleable that it has curvature. And so that it means that, you know, if you're, you know, you see these kind of classic pictures of, a, you know, of a, um, the, you know, the earth sitting on what looks like a rubber sheet or a trampoline. And so it's kind of curved the area of space around it. And so, you know, somebody that, you know, a spacecraft that's moving, you know, through that space, um, you know, like a skateboarder traveling and, you know, in a skate bowl, you know, moves in a circle rather or can move in a circle rather than in a, in a straight line. And there's lots of, you know, the, the picture kind of gets layered on layered. You know, there's this classic XKCD comic where they point out that the only reason that, you know, the rubber sheet will bend is because it's in a gravitational field, you know, so you haven't really explained it. Um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, the, um, but, the, um, but the idea that space is something that's bendy, that's something that's changed by what happens inside of it, that, that's, that's this deep... Um, uh, insight that comes comes from general relativity, and there's a kind of purist interpretation that says that we don't really want to talk about bendy space. Um, but there's a you know there's a kind of practical interpretation that you see space time as, as rather than in Newtonian physics, space and time tell you where things happen and when things happen. But nothing happens to space and time themselves. They're just you know kind of the stage on which the action takes place. Whereas in general relativity, the, um, the space and time are themselves things that are able to change um, as things happen inside the universe. You know, so as the Earth moves around the sun, for instance, the little dimple that, the, you know, that corresponds to our gravitational field in that, in that kind of cartoon picture, that little dimple has to move with us because other time, you know, otherwise our gravitational field would be somewhere different from where the Earth was. And that would be weird. Um, so, you know, that, 
so what that tells us is not only is space stretchy, but also that that it you know once the, something moves out of that region, then it will spring back. Um, then it um, and you know very quickly from there, you know the idea of something that both you know has a restoring force and is stretchable, you know something like gravitational waves, for instance. You know once once you have something that's both deformable but tries to restore itself to its original state, that that's pretty much all you need for wave propagation. And and so we see you know, new phenomena coming arising naturally in general relativity because space is kind of alive in a sense that it's not in the Newtonian picture. And so I, I have this analogy that I use, uh, you know, if I'm teaching a kind of intro to astronomy class that, you know, it's like the difference between like a carpet and a magic carpet, you know, space time is a magic carpet. It, it, it responds to what the other actors on the stage are doing. And, it, you know, it, it, it communicates with the cast in some sense, whereas you know, Newtonian, you know, the Newtonian picture is just kind of hardwood, you know, wooden floor. It, it doesn't, you know, no, nothing, nothing happens to the floor you know, while stuff goes on inside of it. And so Einstein takes 10 years to, to get from special relativity to general relativity. And so it's, it's a much, it's a much more difficult and complex set of ideas. And so what he writes down in the end is a set of equations that looks like this. Uh, and so these um this this is a set or this side here is about geometry and again there's a, there are lots of fancy ways to do this uh, and this set here is um in it like everything that exists you know in terms of fields or, or stuff that carries energy and momentum is, is kind of captured inside of this um, this matrix. And so, so these things are what we call tensors. They're, they're four by four matrices in terms of their representation. The matrices are, are, are symmetric, in fact, so they've got 10 independent components in, a, in space time. And Jim, you know- Yeah, we should, we should us, just say quickly that these are in fact Einstein's equations, just so uh, people- they, These yeah. are the Einstein equations. And so, the, the, I mean, normally, in fact, when you write that, you can actually write them as a, and sometimes you'll just see them as g mu nu is equal to eight pi t mu nu, which is we, you know, they've uh, kind of appropriately, you know, sort of shrunk them down uh, with this capital G. And you know, you set the you set the Newton's constant g, and you set the speed of light c. You set those equal to one, um, you know, in some appropriate set of units. Right. And so this I, just to say, I, a, I know you, is... I know you're a physicist because you keep track of all these constants, which a mathematician would just set to one. So. <laughs> Just, just so people know. No. Sooner or later, you know, like sooner or later, we're going to want to put the mass of the sun in something. You know, sure. if you haven't kept track of the constants, you know, things, sure. things go wrong. Sure. Um, but no, that's but but the interesting. I mean, this equation in some sense is, is kind of as simple as e equals mc squared. You know, it's it's apart from the the little um, indices here. That's a terrible mu. Here we go. I've got a little tail. Um, you know, apart from the indices there, you know, there's nothing to tell you that this is anything more complicated. But it's it's kind of a jack in the box. Because when you actually start digging into what this equation means, is that the gym you knew, if you have ever like looked at, um, uh, you know, multivariable calculus or something like that, at the, at the most at the simplest level, the gym you knew is just kind of keeping track of what your coordinate system is up to. So if you move from, you know, Cartesian to spherical coordinates, you know, and then like everyone, you know, it's like this thing that we used to you know, freak out freshmen in some sense um but but suddenly you go from having you know like um you, you know distances if you've got like something like this you this distance from the origin a change in angle the, the physical distance here is going to be r d theta and so if you want to do the equivalent of pythagoras theorem and non-euclidean coordinates and non or non sorry non-cartesian coordinates then you need to keep track of what the different um, you know how much is the same change in angle at different places in the in the in the coordinate system that you've set up corresponds to a different physical distance, and at the simplest level, the metric is what kind of manages that for you. But what this actually is is it becomes is that this when you read it, the, these things here are things that relate to derivatives of the metric with respect to the coordinates themselves. And so if you get clever, you can start to ask, for instance, you know, does the space have some curvature? So, you know, if I look, if I'm in, you know, the classic example, you know, I put some ants on a globe and, you know, I, I get trained two of them to, you know, start them in the equator and I train two of them to walk, you know, in a direction that's a 90 degrees to the equator. They're both going to meet at the North Pole, you know, even though they're both, you know, these are well-trained ants, so they're moving, you know, definitely in a straight line. And so, the, the, you know, what you've got then is that, you know, they've each moved at, 
you know, not started out 90 degrees to the equator, but they've been met at this point. So the triangle that they've defined is a triangle that doesn't, you know, whose internal angles don't add up to 180 degrees. So the G mu nu that we've got here is like, so this is keeping track of your coordinates. Um, and the, the R mu nu, the, the Ricci tensor and the R, which is related to, which is basically the trace of this tensor, is, is um, that those are the things that, that give you that, that give you what amounts to a differential set of differential equations for your um, for, for the for the metric, which tells you how the metric wants wants to behave. You know what's the shape of space, and so by what you put on the right hand side, then determines the shape of space that lives on the left hand side, and so that gives you a set of differential equations that you can solve uh, for you know for a given configuration of matter. And so Einstein wrote these equations down for the first time in 1915, and you know again just Concept, you know, he's 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 Jewish. He's a pacifist. He's just been recruited back to Berlin, so he's living, you know, he's living in the center of, um, you know, the this kind of this, you know, the this, you know, empire that's locked in, you know, this fir the first global kind of mechanized combat. You know, he's actually recruited back to Berlin by Haber, the Haber process, who's, who's um, you know, like full on into the German war effort, you know, developing poison gas and you know, going to the front. And sort of you know overseeing its deployment and so he's on the other hand he's you know i don't want to bar of this and he's you know he's he's working on um general relativity communicating extensively with hilbert through this time so hilbert and einstein are sort of einstein's worried that he'll be scooped by hilbert if he if he doesn't you know if he doesn't get a you know, crack, crack in um and so by the end of 1915 he's got this this um this this vision of how it is that um that um he can extend his, his theory of special relativity in a way that accounts for what happens when you have a, you know, a, um, you know, he's, he's thinking in terms of, um, uh, you know, how do, how do I think about acceleration, for instance, in the context of a gravitational field? Um, you know, how do, how, do, how do different observers see diff different things? And this leads him to this, to this theory that he writes down. And the theory of GR that we have today is exactly the same. You know, there's been no there's been no changes or modifications made to general relativity. The one thing you can add that then you know I didn't write in is, a, is this cosmological constant term, but you can equally put that on the right hand side. You can say that it's a contribution to the to the energy momentum of the universe rather than seeing it as a as a geometrical component. And he was you know aware of that possibility from 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 the 1920s or certainly well, probably earlier, but certainly you know he he this is something that he considered. And so you've got this new set of equations and this new way of looking at space. And then sort of gets out into the world. And so within, within, within months, in fact, um, Carl Schwarzschild had come up with a solution to the Einstein equations that correspond to a point mass. And so in fact, the point mass is vacuum, you know, like, like everything else in the universe, there's no mass. And so other than right at the center of the Schwarzschild solution, this T mu nu term here is zero. That's, that's what we call a vacuum solution. And so when it's, you know, this has all kinds of you know, um, advantages in terms of being able to, to simplify these equations. So it's, it's, it's like analogous so to the like electric in, in a classical electromagnetism, right? When you have a singularity, there's only charge density at the singularity and nowhere else. Yeah, right? ex exactly, right. exactly. Yeah. So 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 you have this weird singularity, but everywhere else, if you, you know, draw a little Gaussian, um, you know, volume, there's as much flux going in as there as there is going out. The ch charge density is zero, and so the black hole solution. Um, you know, sort of was found by Schwarzschild, who again was was in the German army and had been invalided back from the Russian front, um, and was actually he had he had some horrible skin disease apparently, um, but but something debilitating that eventually killed him. But while he was in hospital, he he assimilated what Einstein had done and solved these equations. And Einstein at the time wasn't even sure that you would be able to solve the mm. equation, actually, you know, for a single spherical mass. Yeah, while we're talking about this this historical note, I'm uh, how do I say? Uh, of course, different people operate at different levels of extraction, and of course, mathematicians work at the level of, oh, I can prove something without even uh, uh, working with examples. But uh, but Einstein, being a physicist, I'm a little surprised that he didn't have at least a non-trivial solution to ground his ideas. Is, is that right? So he um, he done he done a bunch of things. He'd been able to demonstrate that the perihelion precession of Mercury was what um, you know to account for this kind of long-standing discrepancy. Um, so he had done meaningful, I mean, he absolutely done meaningful calculations that he used to test, to test his theory, but he'd done that without writing down like the, I mean, if I was, you know, if I teach perihelion precession, 
you know, I start by writing down the, the swatch shout solution and then working you know, from that. But it turns out he'd found ways, um, and likewise, the deflection of starlight. Oh, I see. Are you saying that all of, you, basically you can work in, with an approximate solution that gives you the right uh, phenomenological yeah, managed to, prediction without exactly, without having an exact to extract i see yeah Res like the way that you would do these things today is you start with the the swatch out solution or the curve solution um you know and the only difference between the swatch out and the curve solution is you put some angular momentum on this mm. this this um you know into this scenario that that um you know that that i mean obviously makes it makes it much more complex than it was but it's uh, um but you know that took 50 years to get 50 years yeah, no hang on yeah, almost 50 years to get from Schwarzschild to, to occur, you know, this kind of flowering of general relativity that happens in, in Texas in the early 1960s. Mm. And so, so, you know, Newton's equations, you know, the joke is, is you can solve the two-body equation, but you can't solve the three-body equation. But in the case of Einstein, it's a struggle just to solve the one-body equation. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see, I see. <laughs> Okay. And so the two-body equation, you know, actually figuring out when what happens when you know two black holes meet and merge, you know, which is this this is like this, this huge computational challenge I see. in numerical relativity that was only fully solved in the 1990s. You know, I, so, I haven't looked at uh, at these uh, solutions in a while, but um, I would imagine that the way you would arrive at the Schwarzschild solution is you do dimensional reduction and then you reduce to say an ODE if you're very lucky, and then that ODE will have a solution. So that. that that's pretty much exactly what you do, and then you then you have a um, a boundary condition essentially that comes from saying I want this to look like Newtonian gravity. I see. Yeah, at a large, although, at a large distance from where I right. started. <laughs> although although phrased that way, uh, Einstein could have done that too, right? So I, I don't know what was. He, he too... probably could have. I mean, I mean, this is in a matter of months, and so he okay. he probably. I mean, he almost certainly could have done. So the first okay. thing you do is to impose um, spherical symmetry. Um, which is which is not unreasonable, and also you say that the solution that you've got is time independent, and so once you've done that, then you've only got in an appropriate coordinate system. The only thing you have left is the is the radial coordinate, um, and so everything is necessarily an ordinary differential equation. And, and there's a there's a couple of tricks you can use to um, you know rearrange the equations. You know you take write something as the exponential of the thing that you're interested in, and you, you know you away you go, and and you 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 solve for the for the you know in the particular coordinate system but even just the the understanding how to do um you know like like the meaning of coordinates in general relativity can become a little bit unclear at times and so i think you know there's a lot of um there's a lot of background knowledge that goes into you know you, you can do this in half an hour you know in class with you know when you're teaching gr but but you're standing on on this this long and quite painfully earned um, you know, collective wisdom that we have as a field in order to be able to do that. But so the the the, the thing that well, this is not explaining how we do cosmology. Well, the opposite that you can do to this is to say, well, I want a cosmological solution. And so one of the things to remember is that during this, you know, at this time, it's in 1923, I think, that Hubble kind of kind of um, convincingly. Um, comes up with the evidence that there are galaxies other than our own and so you know we're talking at the beginning about the 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 you know the broad sweep of the sky you know we sit out under the stars you know as if, as you know as as you know our, our distant distant hominid ancestors would have done you know hundreds or thousands of years ago and this you know the broad sweep of the milky way kind of stretches about our heads you know it's this beautiful thing and so the long-standing challenge for um cosmology or for the astrophysics was well okay Galileo tells us and the first telescopes tell us that this thing is made out of stars um, and that the sun is apparently a star that lives in you know eventually we get to the sun as a star and the sun lives inside of this island of stars and so the question then becomes is, is the Milky Way the only kind of big galaxy that lives at the center of the universe we don't necessarily know how it got there but you know we'll, we'll, <laughs> we can have have various arguments as to how it got there um or are there multiple galaxies like the milky way is and so again you know if i'm teaching this i actually come back to the scene in the movie moana um you know which is the story of i mean it's disney but it's it's you know the story of polynesian voyaging you know so through the islands of the pacific and so you know the polynesian the maori people in new zealand they they knew that they had a very clear understanding that they'd arrived, you know, that they'd sailed, that they'd voyaged and they'd made, you know, back and forth voyages across across the ocean, um, you know, from other places and, and this kind of sea of islands. 
Um, but Moana's people, for whatever reason, you know, in the movie had suppressed this knowledge. They believed that they were this one island in an empty ocean. And the, the challenge that astrophysicists had in the 1920s was kind of akin to this. You know, are we one galaxy in an otherwise kind of infinite and empty you know, ocean of space? Or are there multiple galaxies like ours that are sort of you know, speckled throughout space? And so if you take, um, you know, you can look out into space. And so up until the 1920s, people had seen things that we now know to be galaxies like the Andromeda Nebula, you know, M31, you know, these beautiful things that you can see. And if you see a Hubble image of them, you can see the individual stars. You, you, know, you kind of know what you're dealing with. But, but in, the, you know, in the 1910s, that wasn't necessarily the case. And so you've got two quite different visions of how the universe can be um, on large scales. And it turns out, obviously, that we're living in the universe that where our galaxy is a big galaxy, but it's one of trillions of galaxies. You know, it's, it's much, the universe is much bigger than just the, the 100 billion stars. So, so can, we, can, can we write this? So there's like maybe like hypothesis one, dense and sparse, or yeah. how, how would you write it? Yeah, uh, yeah, island universe, maybe, you know, I, you know okay. uh, sort of it's the one island. Okay. Yep. We're... And two is is you know an infinite. I see. Uh, we'll put that. We'll put infinite and and um, I see. <laughs> inverted commas. So, so one is for a reason that we might. Sure. One is basically uh, we're you know, we're it, we're it, special, it, 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 and then two, I believe, if I uh, recall my history right, that that yeah, that, yeah, that was yeah. quite paradoxical because in this static universe world, you might think that the night sky would be infinitely bright if there was an infinite number of galaxies. So right? so this is exactly the the if the universe is infinitely old and stars you know, exist an infinite distance away, then eventually wherever you look, there's a star. Um, you know, and so the stars get smaller and smaller, but there's also you know, more of them. You know, so you've got it's what's known as um, Olver's paradox. You know, so you've got a couple of stars here, but then you've got you know, more stars in the same region. Or in this, and so that combination of like, yeah, there's, the, each individual star is smaller than fainter, but there's more of them. Eventually, wherever you look, you're, you're you're gonna you're gonna see a star, and so the the argument, the, the flip side of that argument is for that to work, the universe has to be infinitely old, and the stars have to be able to shine forever because you know the, otherwise you're going to run out of um, light. So there's a variety of things that go into this argument, but the fact that the sky actually, is dark at actually night does the is telling us something. Does the universe need to be infinitely old? You could just uh, you know whatever god or whatever could just create the universe all at once infinitely large with infinitely many stars right so uh... but it also but the god would also have that did that would also have to have created the light from those stars in flight oh oh i see oh i see i see I, and, I, I and so 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 the argument then is well yeah but they that, that same argument applies to five minutes ago complete with the memory of us having talked to each other so if you want to you know like a causal you know, universe that sort of obeys the laws of physics Got it. as well as we can, then then you do need to have, you, you need an infinite amount of time and the stars need to be able to shine, you know, continue I see. With running, without running Got out it. of all. Um, and then people tried to, various ways people tried to polish it away by saying, oh, you know, maybe there's lots of gas between the stars and it absorbs the light. But if it absorbs the light, it has the gas would heat up. And so, <laughs> like, the, like people have tried, you know, like a variety of, of, of dodges. But the, the argument in our case, what we're going to see is that the universe is, is, is only a finite age. And so, so that is, that's the way that our particular universe sidesteps, um, you know, this, this so called paradox. But the, the, the mathematical trick that was pulled, and the first person to do this was, was Friedman in the, in the early 1920s. Oh, Russian, he's a meteorologist, yeah. I think. Let's put, um, yeah. as well. Let's write, so, let's write so some, a, let's write some dates too, just so, just so we get the yeah. dates. Yeah. So, this so, is, I'm, so I'm doing this yeah. off the top of my head. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I okay. Say, yeah. Otherwise, early 1920s. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have Hubble. And so Hubble, what he does is he establishes, he, he sees this, uh, what's clearly a Cepheid variable in M31, the Andromeda Nebula. And so he establishes M31 as another galaxy. And it, he actually gets it a little closer to the Earth than it, than it really is. So he thought it was smaller than the Milky Way, but it was much too big to be you know, like a little cloud of gas or whatever that was sitting kind of on the outskirts of the Milky Way, which was the alternative. Sorry, so is this the uh, first galaxy that's not our own to be confirmed? Yeah, to be kind of convincingly identified as something that is big enough that it has to be, you know, that that's far enough away that it must be, you know, 
something that's not a whole lot smaller than the Milky Way. As it turns out, it's actually a little bit larger than the Milky Way, but it's it was enough for it to be in the same category of objects as, as, as us, I guess. Hmm. Um, so he does this in the 1920s. Um, and then we have around the same time, and I never remember whether he's... Um, one N or two, the, the, you know, the mapping from Russian to, to, mm. to English. So, mm. so, um, so Friedman, Friedman um, is a he's a meteorologist. He's, he's he establishes the world balloon altitude record at some point, <laughs> doing sort of in situ meteorology. So he sounds like kind of an adventurer, and he had I think quite a complicated private life. Um, but he he you know, was a was an accomplished mathematician working in in um, Russia in the early 1920s, so in the early Soviet Union. And he, he makes the opposite. He, what he does is he says, instead of assuming that the universe is like a single point, I'm going to assume that the universe is completely smooth, that it's, that it's the same in every direction. And also that it's the same, um, that, that it, you know, looks, you know, if I look in any direction, it looks the same, but also that it's the same at every point. Um, and so that the universe is, is you know whatever material there is in the universe is completely uniformly distributed and so that is the kind of the, the hard opposite of saying that we live in a single galaxy hmm. that's kind of the center of space and the center of the universe and so it's it's, it's yeah you know it's an intellectually audacious move sure so that. so the technical words would be and, homogeneous and isotropic right yeah, so homogeneous is that every is that your translation invariant that every point is the same as every other point. And isotropic, obviously, is that you have rotational mm -hmm. invariance about at least one point. And then you you look at this and you say, well, actually, like, and then you can prove that. And so this is obviously not saying anything about time dependence. Um, but if you look at a three dimensional space, once you once you've got something that has a, a single um, point about which it's um, isotropic but also you've got the homogeneity, then you've got enough, there's enough symmetry there so that there's no more, um, yeah. there's no more, there's no additional symmetry yeah. that Although you can add. You say that, that this is a bit audacious, but it seems uh, on the one hand, uh, the, the most simple thing one can do mathematically and natural mathematically. So I'm wondering what, what you mean by, <laughs> by audacious exactly, because I think that when you look around, at, <laughs> most of the space is empty. So that's like the, the default hypothesis, right? So if you say that space is completely empty, if you say that space is a vacuum, then, then you do not get this. The only way that you can make this work other than or if, you, if you said that space most of space is pretty empty, so I'm going to say that it has absolutely nothing in it, <laughs> and every point in space is like every other point. Then what you've said is I've got a completely empty universe with nothing in it at all, and then at that point Einstein's equations kind of collapse back to special relativity. There's no there's no gravity because there's right. nothing to gravity. Minkowski about. space, right? So you, it's just empty. It's, and, it's right. Minkowski yeah, space. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, so that hasn't that hasn't bought you anything. Okay. You would like to have some cosmology. Okay. 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 <laughs> so, so so that's like your trivial solution that's zero everywhere or something okay. like that. Yeah. Sure. It's, it's a good solution, but it's not it's not informative. I okay. Guess. Okay. Um. And so what he does is he and so but it is kind of a I mean he did it I guess as a mathematical construct i mean he wasn't this but but it's the it's the absolute hard opposite of this argument you know we live in a special space you know not only you know we're, we're homo homogenizing the universe on a scale that that means that you know individual galaxies disappear <laughs> and that 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 you know that that's like a you know that's that's a very extreme move to be making in the early 1920s i mm. think i think is what i would say when i look at that you know it's like mm. You know, we look at the, you know, at a tabletop and we say, oh, you know, there's atoms, um, but we're going to we're going to treat the solid as a continuum. We're not going to, but but we're living inside. Yeah, I, I guess it's atoms. I guess it's the difference between being a theoretician and an experimentalist or a phenomenologist. Because if you're the latter, you have actual concrete objects you're you're working with. It's like it's like high school physics where you have like two or three billiard balls colliding. Like you you have something there. Whereas if you're a theorist, it's like, well, I have space, so it's more natural to think about it in terms of being empty or or, or symmetrical, right? Uh, I, I see that I as being the distinction. True, but I think, I mean, from our point of view today, I guess it's because this actually maps to the way that we understand the universe, you know, physically. It seems like a reasonable thing to do. And then we can start to say, well, you know, what point does that averaging, you know, does, 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 do we start to see some granularity in the mm -hmm. universe? But it, it, I mean, I mean, maybe it seems like the obvious thing to do. And it's like one way that you can get out of, you know, that you can make progress algebraically. So in, in some ways, it's a it's a completely reasonable thing for him to have done, but it always just blows me away that he 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 he's sitting at a time where this looks like a fairly contested, you know, it's the extreme version of 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 a 
you know, one side or another of an argument that's, that's you know, completely live argument in astronomy at that point. Hmm. And so he just, he just goes absolutely hard out and says, no, I'm just going to, like, everything in the universe is, like, just, just mush. I'm, going to, okay. <laughs> I'm just going to treat everything as if it's smooth, and then I'm going to see what happens. And so when you do that, it's just as you said, um, you turn the only thing that the universe is allowed to change as a function of at that point is time. Um, and so you take the, the, this complicated set of partial differential equations that Einstein wrote down, and you boil it down to a pair of ordinary differential equations. And that, that's enough to, it turns out, to get you these equations that you can understand. Um, and then you can solve, um, there's, there's two, there's, one, there's one kind of limit that's slightly more complex than the other, but the, the, the simplest version that you write down, if you put in simple matter, then you get something that's just a power law as a function of time. So, so a universe that contains, uh, you know, what we call dust. So something that doesn't have any pressure, there are no collisions, um, you know, but just, just gets kind of thinned out by expansion. Uh, the, the, the universe, uh, the expansion of the universe goes like a to t to the two thirds. Actually, and should so we you can... should we write out the answer? I remember it was basically there's a dt squared and then and then there's like a there's a, a space uh, part. So that's let, me, let, me, let me let me write down. Let me back up a little bit. Yeah. So what you actually get is you get an equation, and I'm putting in the units. Uh, so I had to go and look up the where exactly the units are going because I don't usually put them in. Uh, oh, t minus. And I think this, I think this is an energy density, um, the way that it's written. But I, once you've said c equal to c equal to one, then an energy density and a mass density become equivalent to one another. This is a constant that is it's only the only the sign of the constant matters, and then you have some other constant here that shows up, and then you have a of t squared. And so this A of T is a scale factor, and it tells you if you imagine taking a coordinate system that you paint on the, the kind of background of space time, and then the universe expands. So this distance here, for instance, gets mapped to this distance here. Yeah, so actually, let's just write out, isn't the metric something yeah. uh, like, uh, so let me just, uh, oh, is so, I, so no, let me, sorry, yeah, let me, exactly, so let me, let me sorry. Um, so, so there's this, this distance here as the universe expands, you know, as a function of time is mapped to this distance here. And so if you take this coordinate distance, which might be delta x and some coordinatization, this distance here is the physical distance is delta x times a of t. And so you say, you know, this is like you're looking at the world or looking at the, you know, the, the globe that you are you know, having ants crawl on. And so, you know, if you measure the distance between San Francisco and Auckland as in degrees as a function of longitude and latitude, that's the same on the sphere as it is on the Earth. But if we blew the sphere up, sure. said, you know, how far is it to walk, right. then that, that, that difference would be captured by what we call the scale factor. Yes. And that scale factor absolutely is, is, one of, is, is, is one of the, is the only free parameter that lives in the metric. So the, the metric of space-time when you solve Einstein's equations has this, um, this scale factor that lives inside of it that tells you basically how much is my coordinate system stretching as a as a function of time. Yeah, I, th I think I wrote the I, differential equation for that. Yeah, I, I think the metric has this form, correct? Where it, uh, the 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 four dimensional uh, uh, Lorentzian yeah, metric. Except you'd put a um, you'd put a put a minus sign in front. Ah, uh, that's right. Yeah, I was, that's right. I was I was <laughs> Euclid, Euclidean for a second. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If, you're, you, if you're working if you're working in it with an imaginary time coordinate, yeah. you can get away yeah. with that. Right. And then also, if you want to start a, you know, if you ever want to like escape from a room full of theoretical physicists, the best way to start a fight is to get them to argue about like whether or not um, this should be this or this. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Oh, you know it's funny in the U.S. And, and so while and so while they're fighting over that, you can you can kind of make your escape. The funny thing is, I know <laughs> having been, I grew up in the West Coast. And I did my graduate studies at MIT, and I forget which one's the West Coast or the East Coast metric, but I, I don't. That seems like a very. Uh, it's, uh, not just, it's also <laughs> there's a there's a distinction between um, people who have a background in quantum field theory. And people who have a background in gravity, um, or, or or more in general. Sure. So, if, so, if, if your geometer or so space should be positive definite, right? And then yeah, and, the, and then but if, also the, 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 there's there's a couple of reasons why in quantum field theory people might like um, the 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 plus triple minus form. 
Um, so, so there are kind of right. field differences and there are, there sure. are um, probably geographical differences. Sure. Um, but, 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 but yeah, so, so, but this, this is like a, um, in, in simple terms, this might be dx squared plus dy squared. That's right. So there's actually plus dz squared. Yeah. So this this, this, d, this dx squared is, is that, and then this whole thing is multiplied by by um, by that. And this would only this was this is for a universe that has no spatial curvature. So so very it turns out when this in the in the limit in a special case where this term here doesn't um, contribute to the equations. Right. So basically, this ds squared has three cases. Right. So there's there's uh, maybe. This ds squared, right, corresponds to either, you know, um, uh, you know, flat geometry where this kappa you wrote was zero, sort of spherical, when kappa yeah, once, is equal once to one. Yeah, once you move to the case where this, it's not spherical, um, then you have to, then then actually the coordinatization becomes a little bit more complex. Um, yeah. So so, yeah, so, right. so that what we've written down here is, is is kind of irredeemably flat in some sense, but the where you allow the the three so 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 you know the, the spatial equivalent of a sphere and also in three dimensions you get this extra you know hyperbolic option those those correspond to um to the case where, where you've got this extra this extra non um extra term that comes that comes from this piece here that you get from solving the equations and their, their full generality but the the and and maybe I mean, if you go back in history too, there's a lot, you know, like the value of this term here tells you whether or not the universe is going to expand forever. Mm -hmm. If all you have here is something that is corresponding to say, you know, sort of pressureless matter or something like this. So, mm. so this term here has this kind of sort of drives the long-term geometry of the universe. Whereas once you have something like dark energy, um, then the, the long-term future of the universe and yeah. the presence of this term decouple from yeah. each other. So let, let's go back. So, yeah. So the, yeah. We, let's go back to yeah the, the previous slide. So basically, uh, so you wrote, so let, let's actually, let's back up. So so actually, if we go even uh, all the way back, right, you wrote Einstein's equations. The point is, if you substitute into Einstein's equations, this ansatz you wrote here with the A of T, and then of course, the stress energy term T also has some dimensional reduction properties, so you have right? To yeah, so the stress energy term you put in, um, firstly diagonalize it. So you say that there's only pressure. Um, there's no, like if you're in a kind of complex fluid and there's, you know, there's, there's, there's you know, material flowing, you know, in a circle, then yeah. you've got a transfer of momentum, you know, in one direction across, you know, a surface. And so we're going to, we're going to say there's only pressure and density. There's nothing. Yeah, I think, no I think, I think it's, it's diagonal with only two terms, right? So the zero, zero term is the. Um, is that right? So the, the, the this is the um, density, yeah, and these yeah. ones here are the pressure. And the yeah. fact that you've said that space is isotropic, right, says that each of those entries has to be the same as right. each other. So you've only got two things. Yeah, um, and then you can actually you, you can I'm going to change I'm going to move slides because it's sure. getting a little crowded. Sure, oh, here we sure, go. okay. Um, <laughs> um, and so, so so then you get to this interesting situation where you can actually. Um, the result that you get depends on the relationship between the density and the pressure. Okay. And so are you on seven or actually, you're on eight now? Uh, no, I'm on, I'm on seven of eight. Here we go. You're on uh, no, eight. Isn't, you're on eight or seven. seven. You're on eight. I'm on seven. Seven. Okay. I'm on seven. Okay. 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 <laughs> All right. Great. Um, and so, so, so you wind up with this um, result that says that um, do you get this for a dot over a squared? And so this a dot over a is sometimes called the Hubble parameter, sometimes called h, because it tells you essentially how fast the universe is expanding. Right. Um, you know, a dot is just the derivative of the scale factor. It's so a re relative factor. velocity, essentially. Right. Yeah. And then I'm gonna, I'm just gonna drop the c's because that sure make things go wrong if I don't. And I'll drop that that last term. But then the next term you get is something that looks like this. And so this is a conservation equation that you can get. There's a there's a um, there's a conservation law that applies. There's a there's a derivative essentially the equivalent of a, um, something that looks like charge conservation. You know, we're talking about electromagnetism where you've right. got like sure. the amount of charge in the box I is see. equal to the like the I the, see. The, the the generalization. Yeah. Of that Sorry. So actually, so so the first just to be clear, so the, the this first equation here is actually Einstein's equations uh, uh, directly. And then are you saying this one is this one just the di divergence equation? This this guy. 
Um, they're is that what you're one of the divisions. It's like, and the fancy language is that the covariant derivative of the energy momentum tends to zero that expresses the conservation of energy momentum the... in the system. And so then there's a corresponding statement that you can make about the, um, about the left hand side of the equation. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Well. You're saying the full, you mean just the full, the full covariant derivative of the stress energy momentum pressure is zero? Really? Um, so, so that means, you know, the amount of stuff going in and out of a region is, is, is related to, to what is, um, so the, 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 the conservation of energy momentum is, you know, is, 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 um, make sure, <laughs> make sure I'm saying this right. It, there's, there's a, there's a kind of conserve, there's a conservation law that applies. And so, in fact, what you have is, is you have three equations, but only two of them are, or you can write down three different equations. But it turns out that only two of them are independent, so you can always get from you know oh, any two of them to the. To I the see. Third one. I just thought the the conservation was that always a divergence equals to zero, but you just said that the full covariant derivative was zero, which is much stronger. Just... Um, well, it's a two-dimensional object, which means that you have to be a little bit careful about you know. So, so the thing that you're writing down is a vector and not a not a um, not a scalar, if that makes sense. Oh, so it's not like taking the divergence of a three vector and 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 getting a number. Sorry. I, I, let, let, uh... We're talking about general GR in general, not not the particulars of this thing, right? So the stress yeah, energy yeah, tensor yeah, is a, yeah. is a two tensor, and then its covariant derivative would be a three tensor, and then it's no, no, no. So so it's a covariant derivative that's been contracted on one of the indices. So it oh, that's takes what, you down to oh, okay, that's what I meant by a diver. I think we're just using yeah, yeah, different yeah, terms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and so yeah. So on the left hand side, you have that that expressed as a geometrical identity, and so the way that Einstein gets to the Einstein equations is he wants something that has the appropriate behavior when you take its derivative that, you know, I've got this thing on the left-hand side that's geometry. I want it to have the same, you know, um, you know if I, and, and I'm going to set it equal to whatever's on the right-hand side, which is the source term. And so if the source term has this property that I take its derivative in, you know, in an appropriate way and it vanishes, then I've got to come up with a combination of geometrical objects that sit on the left-hand side that are guaranteed to vanish and don't just vanish in some, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes and not other times. I see. And so it's that combination of things that leads Einstein, you know, say, well, why is it, um, you know, why is there a half, you know, why isn't it a quarter or a third or a two, or, you know, like the reason it's a half is because you want the, you want that combination of terms to have the same properties under a covariant derivative as the, um, yep. as, as the, as the energy momentum tensor does. Uh -huh. And so that's the kind of, that's the physical intuition that leads Einstein to, 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 to write down the Einstein equations. Uh, um, let's see. I, uh, interesting. Oh yeah. Okay. This it's been a while since I took GR, but okay. But I did write. Yeah, I, I, I mean, did. You can, uh, yeah. I did write down the di if, if you help it. Yeah. I was gonna say if you help it, you write down a you write down an action and you you bury that's, it. Sure. Um, oh, I see. That's right. And, you get, that's and right. you get the same. And you get the same equation. That's right. That's right. That's right. I did write down the correct diverge uh, equation, right? This contraction of the covariant derivative along two yeah, indices. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. If you yeah. if, if that mu was was like a kappa or something. Then you'd have a three. Then you'd be taking yeah. the, the covariant. And if you're being super fussy too, you put the you'd put the mu upstairs. So. Oh uh, yeah, mu sorry. Mu yeah, mu that's right. Yeah, I was being. Yeah, that's right. I was being a little sloppy there. But so uh, there's like yeah. half a point off of that maybe. Yeah. Okay. Time, but, um, <laughs> okay. Well, you know, this is the pod but, but, the podcast. But, you know, it's, it's, podcast it's, bar is lower. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, exactly. It's spiritually correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. But the so, but the so yeah, if you just took a derivative of everything, you'd wind up with something that you know if you take the derivative of the scalar, you get a vector. But you can, you know, if you take the derivative of the, you know, if you if you dot the divergence operator into the vector, then you get a scalar. And so you've started out with something that's a, yeah, that's the rank two object. You take you take its derivative as a contraction, and you wind up with. Okay, something so you were saying point. actually that this equation actually would actually has two components, right? Because the the new could basically be a time or space index. What did you say happens with the second equation? Because right now we so, have so so the, so we've got two we've got two equations. We've got another one that has um, uh, that that is um, going to look like a double dot over a and that is proportional to minus rho plus i'm just i'm not going to put the constants in mm -hmm. plus 3p and so we may want to we'll, we want to come back to this one when we come to talk mm. about inflation mm, okay. but the key thing is is you've got this conservation equation here and so if you just say that the pressure is zero then you've immediately got an equation that when you solve this equation it tells you that the density of the universe if you if you double a if a grows by a factor of two, then the size of any given box is grown by a factor of eight, you know, by two cubed. And so, mm. so what? So by the way, so I, I was wondering, just should there be a spaced derivative of 
of t uh, of of something somewhere, or or is that incorporated in the definition? No, because of... we've assumed we've assumed that everything and oh, oh, that's right, is, is independent of ah, uh, you're right, you're right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, okay, great. And so so yeah. so okay. um so so we Got anything it. that's the spatial derivative is, is going to vanish Got at it. this point. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, and so the 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 cool or the interesting thing about this is is that the you know the intuition you have if I have a box of rocks and I make the box twice as big on every side, then its volume goes up by a factor of eight, then I expect its density to go down like a factor of eight. So the density of a, the density of dust in the universe has to scale like one over a cubed, like the, the size of, of the, you know, the, the, the dimensions of each side of the box. And so you can see that physically. And you put, and so that then tells you that all well, this is one over a cubed, or well, the row is one over a cubed. If I go back to this equation here, then I can now take this particular expression that I've got for rho, I replace that with one over a cube times some constant that you know tells me what the density is at my you know time of you know equal to one or whatever. Um, and then I've got an then I've got a, a, a simple first order differential equation that only depends on a. Um, and then I solve it. I can then I solve that differential equation to get to you know to the a goes like t to the two thirds. And what we call a matter-dominated universe, a universe that has nothing in it but but, but rocks. Um, and so, as the universe expands, and you know, all of the rocks have been you know, laid out, you know, smoothly, as the universe expands, the scale factor you know grows, um, you know, sublinearly with time. And so, this is this is something that immediately pops out of Friedman's equation. So, can you can you reset it, or maybe, and also write down what are the hypo like is is two thirds something special, or or you just pick two thirds? No, two thirds is the key thing about two thirds is that it's less than one. Oh, okay. Um, or the <laughs> okay, okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, but 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 the particular thing that comes from this is that once I put in, um, you know, one over a cubed here. Okay. So I've I've gone back to six and I've drawn in like one. I've I've said well okay now rho is one over a cubed because that's how I expect the density to scale mm. in a pressureless universe. Um, and so then I've got a dot over a squared that's equal to one over a cubed you know like you can you, that's an integral that you can do and when you get when you do that integral then you get the two-thirds and the two-thirds is coming or well, the three is obviously coming from the, for, that's the dimensionality of space-time if we lived in a four-dimensional universe i so, so actually had density would go down like one over a four and and we would have a slightly different equation see how did you get uh let, let me just rewrite it because actually on my side there's there's like a little thing at the top that's slightly blocking the one over a over q i don't know if you can uh, see that let me let me let's 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 just let's just do this do this nicely <laughs> yeah should we just go to do slide so we, yeah yeah he's going to go to a brand new slide i want slide yeah. eight so okay. I don't have yeah, a yeah, yeah 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 how did you G. i see i was wondering how you got the a cubed because you had all these other terms you, you had some assumption about the row uh to get so, the, so the, the assumption here and i'm just going to make sure that i've got the right let me just write this up. i've also got this equation this um continuity equation mm -hmm. Which I get uh, you know, oh, from okay. the energy of inner tensor. Uh -huh. uh, I have this messy line here. Uh, that rho plus p is equal to zero. But I've said that I've got no pressure. And so once I say I've got no pressure, then this term drops out. And now I've got an equation that actually looks like, if we want to be, we can be, you know, we've got an equation that looks like this minus three a dot a. And so if I solve that equation, then I get something that looks like log rho is equal to minus three log a ah i see and then i and then i um and you know then i just exponentiate by the sides of that then i get rho goes like one over a cube and i you know i have to get it obviously i want a rho naught here and an mm -hmm. a naught here so that everything and, and, and this was in the case of sense. of a uh, of a flat universe right kappa equals so zero this is in the, so this is true in fact of any universe this this doesn't care because i've all i've done here is to solve the continuity equation this just says all this says is that if i take a box of rocks I make the box twice as big, then the density goes down by a factor of two cubed rather than by a factor of two. This is this is all all of this expresses. Oh, sorry, yeah. Is the dense, yeah. The, the, so, so that's just saying that's just saying something about the material that lives inside it. Sure, sure, it's, sure. But I meant in terms of plugging it back into the Fred, Friedman equation that that required flat when space. I, when I write when I write the Friedman equation in terms of this expression, mm -hmm. um, then I've left out the term that corresponds to the curvature. Right. And so we can if we put the Curvature. To, so I'm going to go to the next slide. Sure. Um, so this has got something that goes like rho, and then it's got something that goes like plus a constant over a squared. Um, actually, that minus a constant. 
not all natural is minus a squared. And so what I'm saying is if the, if the universe contains only matter, then this, this goes to a dot over a squared is proportional to one over a cubed minus k over a squared. And so what that tells me is that if a is very small, I can ignore the curvature term. But if a gets very large, then at some point the curvature term is going to become important. So, you know, as, as a, so a is a big number and one over a big number cubed is, is, is obviously going to be smaller than mm -hmm. one over mm -hmm. a big number squared. Mm -hmm. So at some, at the, at the, you know, as, as the universe gets older and older, then this curvature term becomes more important. But when, we've, when the universe is very small, then I can ignore it because I can always find a regime in which this term here is going to be the problem. Right, so, I'll the, so, 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 so small... He dominates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah, yeah. large. So, a so right after the Big Bang. And so the, the fact that we can put in this T goes like T, A of T goes like T to the two thirds. Then immediately, I mean, I, and I've cheated a little bit because I could have said T minus T naught to two thirds. You know, I've got an arbitrary, I can move my time variable by an arbitrary amount. But, um, but let's, let's say that I've said T naught equals zero. Then that immediately says that when T is equal to zero, A is equal to zero. And if A is equal to zero, every point in the universe is zero distance away from every other point in the universe. And lo and behold, I've said that if I exist at any finite time in the universe after the Big Bang, which I have to because I don't want the density of the universe to be identically zero, then I, the, the point at which the universe has, that every point in the universe is on top of every other point in the universe is some finite distance in my past. And so... <laughs> like like there's a tiny i mean it's like a kind of magic trick you know where the guy puts like a rock and the you know jug of water into a into a bowl and then you know pulls out like rabbits and hats yeah. and scarves because so, you've put like just a tiny amount of information into 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 these assumptions and then you've said well if yeah. that's the case so yeah let's the let, universe has to have begun at a finite let's, let's time let's take a, let's, that's like yeah let's take a step back okay so yeah. this is all relatively simple mathematics right now yeah, the yeah. thing is we're just following the mathematics literally now yeah, i'm sure yeah, when yeah. this was proposed uh there, there, you know it, it wasn't accepted right away but nevertheless uh this derivation has stood the test of time this, this is the derivation right it's, yeah. it's an argument that's based on symmetry and an ordinary yeah. differential equation you know, yeah like if you solve it once you solve it forever right um as you say the question is is this just like a mathematical curiosity um you know is the universe really you know uniform on large scales as you know it seems to be but but like a huge assumption when these equations were written down and the other story is of course is that friedman died in the mid-1920s and so the same work was done by a belgian physicist by the name of george lemaitre um, essentially the same assumptions and obviously the same results um, and he's in fact a jesuit priest um, so all of the photos you see of lemaitre you know he's wearing a top <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, like, like, wow. like, you know, he's, he taught at a, at a um, Catholic university in Belgium, I think. Um, and, and he, his work was known. So, so his work became known relatively quickly. And then it's developed in the 1930s by people like Robertson and Walker. And, um, uh, you know, there's a variety of um, people who are, you know, start to think about the thermodynamics of the early universe. And, you know, that, that, that sort of grows from that point. But Friedman and Lemaitre, as far as anyone knows, worked essentially independently from each other. You know, the Lemaitre, I think, published in Nature, and I can't, I can't remember. And you know, Fried, Friedman's yeah. papers were published. In fact, Friedman must have published in, I think, Anland of Physics, the German journal. So people were definitely aware, you know, the, the, the handful of people who were thinking about this in a serious way would have been aware of, the, of these different kind of, um, you know, lines of inquiry. Um, but but the idea that the that if you you know once you put in these tiny assumptions into this kind of framework that general relativity provides, it's telling you that the universe in fact wants to have begun at a finite time in the past. I see. Um, actually, let's introduce some dates because I, I think there, if I recall, there's there's actually two sources of the expanding universe. One is this derivation. The other was Hubble's observation of the uh, uh, recession. Or the galaxies receding, right? So exactly. when did those exactly. happen and, and how do those two 
inform science, each other or, so, or, or take precedence. So, is a, I mean, historians of science kind of debate this. So, Hubble, 1923 or thereabouts, establishes that okay. there's galaxy. I think, I think the paper came out in 1925, but astronomers are terrible gossips. So, I think, I think it was kind of established that he'd been able to do this, oh, so, you know, prior to that. I see. So, Hubble, so, so 23, think, and, and what, uh, Friedman was 25? So, I think 23, is, 23 was the observation. Friedman, I, I can't remember exactly, but early 20s. Okay. Um, the matra is maybe 27. Okay. And then, so once Hubble's established that there are other galaxies, he then goes to, you know, he wants, he, he takes spectra of those galaxies and he establishes that there's this, um, you know, apparent correlation between their distance that he infers partly from, you know, these particular variable stars, but using some other methods as well. Um, and their redshift. So the further away a galaxy is, it, it seems like the faster it's, it's, um, it's receding from us. And so that's 1929 um, that he publishes this paper that says that maybe the universe is expanding. Oh, um, I see. Or it looks like that. And so just, you know, six or seven years later, you know, you first you get galaxies and then, or, you know, confirmation that, that you know, because people had debated whether or not, you know, once we knew we lived in this island of stars, you know, I mean, the, the argument as to whether or not there were other islands was, you know, at that point, you know, well over 100 years old. Um, in fact, you know, pretty much as soon as you say, oh, the Milky Way is this island of stars and the sun's somewhere inside of it, then the immediate question you're going to get from your five-year-old is, you know, like, well, are there others? You know, this is the, <laughs> this is the obvious thing to ask. And it was in the 1920s that we, you know, that we got a definitive answer to that question. And so, but it's only six years later that the result that the universe is expanding is something that Hubble's able to, to, to um, put his hand on. And even at that point, people might have said, well, you know, maybe light kind of is tired you know maybe there's something funky going on you know like we don't you know is this a real effect is it somehow you know i mean there's you know people might have i think people the reality of that expansion i think was something that people that looked into but hubble one of the things that the sort of historians of this debate is that hubble definitely knew about the work that lemaitre had done and so he he had a kind of theory, you know this kind of joke i guess that, you know no experimental result is true until it's been, you know, confirmed by theory. And, and so, you know, obviously observers don't believe that, but, but theoreticians you know, <laughs> have this kind of sneaking suspicion that that might be the case. So Hubble definitely had this awareness that there was this theoretical framework that he could drop this idea of the expanding universe into, and it wouldn't look completely insane. Oh, it's interesting. That, that, that we're living at the center of an expanding universe. Like, I like see. you know, you've... So, so you're saying that like, hit, like hit. first you've made this mm -hmm. so, so first you've made this kind of like Copernican move you know we're not you know like there's tons of galaxies and they, you know they can be as bigger or smaller than our one and then suddenly six years later you're saying oh sorry guys the universe is actually expanding and we're in the center of it I see. You know, that, so, that, so, that, that's embarrassing I see so it's a debatable okay so so definitely the this theoretical derivation we sketched out uh happened first and then it's debatable whether Hubble's observation 29 was uh either a, a, a kind of a, a fresh observation or did it have a prior in in this no he 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 knew okay I mean, it was definitely a fresh observation he, he wasn't expecting to see this i think would be fair to say he you know he figured i think everyone figured that these things were moving if you take the redshift you know that's the the, the you know we're assuming a mathematically literate audience so you've measured the velocity along the line of sight from the uh, you know just from the doppler effect and so that would be enough you know, he, he wouldn't have had a clear expectation about what was going on, but it's the obvious thing to do once you've taken the spectra of these galaxies. Now, the spectra tells you what they're made of. It also tells you how fast they're moving. And so he would, he would have done that. Yeah, he would have undertaken that program anyway. But, but the fact that the, there was a theoretical framework that allowed you to make sense of an expanding universe, that's kind of a weird coincidence because, you know, Hubble's ability to do what he did depends on, you know, the people building the 100 inch telescope at Mount Wilson, the development of, you know, photographic film that's good enough to catch a spectrum, you know, taking the spectrum of a galaxy is, is a much more, um, you know, um, informa you know there's, it takes much longer to, to get a spectrum out of a galaxy than it does just to take an image of it. So you have to have film that will be able to capture it. And, you know, spectrographs that, are, you know, there's lots of things that have to happen to make that possible. And so the fact that Einstein did the same, did this in 1915, and then these guys pretty quickly afterwards were able to develop the the ideas. There's not there's no good reason why that had to happen in the same decade as each other. I think that's probably true. Hmm. Um, you know, you could. I mean, I mean, I don't think 
I think the claim that Einstein is this kind of singular genius that, you know, if he, if he, you know, something terrible had happened to him as a child, you know, would still be waiting for GR. That, that's clearly not true. <laughs> but, but, you can, okay. but you can certainly imagine, you know, Hilbert, Hilbert wasn't you know, that far behind him and Poincaré was, was definitely close to special relativity, for instance. But, but you can certainly imagine, you know, a slightly different history where, where some of these ideas have been had, you know, in different decades. But to have them within a couple of years of each other is kind of, you know, it's one of these kind of you know, two things that happen on very parallel tracks and then suddenly, suddenly converge in this, this, this observation that the, that the universe might be expanding. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm trying to, okay, so, so, okay, so let's just, let's just pause for a second. So th this, what we've discussed now, this singularity, that, that is the conventional Big Bang, uh, uh, that is t equals zero right. a is equal to right. zero everything in the universe is on top of right. everything else like there is no distance that, yeah. that is exactly the yeah. singularity yeah the maybe maybe two questions i have as i was sort of thinking about uh well there's there's first of all sort of uh, <laughs> um you know I'll, I'll just write it as gr versus qm right so how, how literally can we trust these equations down to the singularity so that's one question and then second maybe, maybe i should have asked one first because maybe it's going to be a simpler question but sort of what what, what um uh, uh, there, there's this t parameter but in what sense what sense is it time so, so that's a, that's so right I this a of t, a, a of t right because because it's just a rate of change of a it's more like mm -hmm. a rate of change than real time right because for example like i was thinking about this this a of t this a dot this doesn't need to be bound by the speed of light because it's not an actual thing that's moving it's just governing the evolution of this mathematical yeah, object exa right exactly. so it's not it's not a real velocity not a speed. right it's not a real velocity yeah a dot is not and, a velocity and, and t is not a time right it's just it's just a pr mathematical uh uh, units, the other thing right? is, is if you if you have two different objects in the universe, what it's really telling you is the universe is expanding. Right. So if you've got an infinite universe um, and you go far enough away, then it tells you that those you know the distance, the velocity that that object is moving away from us is given. You know, if, if the distance is a delta x, then delta x by definition isn't changing because that's you know that's painted on. And so the velocity comes from taking, you know, as a dot times delta x. And so if you make delta x big enough, you're always going to get the distant parts of the universe moving away from you faster than the speed of light. And so the, the, the physical understanding of that is that everybody in the universe thinks they're at rest. So we don't see anybody moving faster than the speed of light. But if you're a photon and you set out from here, and you're trying to get to here, and this distance, you know, and, and the distance between those two things is growing faster than the speed of light, it's like you're, you know, you're on some satanic running track, and and the finish line is is you know the running track is being stretched as you're running on it, and so the finish line is being moved mm -hmm. away from you faster than you can close the distance. Right. And so you know, like we would be able to see that because we're running slower than the speed of light. But from the point of view of a you know a photon trajectory, it's trying to you know it's propagating as best it can towards us. But if we're moving away, you know, if, if the distance because of the expansion of the universe is changing fast enough. Then, um, then it will just you know that, that the light from that object is never going to reach us, and so right. it turns out that you know because you've got this t to the two thirds, it means that distant objects you take their velocity, um, you know you you get something that looks like t to the minus one third, and if you take the acceleration, then you get something that's negative. So the distant distant objects are always slowing down relative to each other. So eventually they you know distant parts of the increasingly distant parts of the universe become visible to us that weren't previously visible in this scenario of the mm. Big Bang. And so the question is, you know, we can only see if you go back to T equals zero and you say how big a piece of the universe can we see, then that piece of the universe gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as um, as as time passes. So even if space is infinite, the volume of the universe that we can see is in, in, at least in this um, matter dominated scenario is, is finite actually sorry, sorry. and so uh, the, le, 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 wait sorry le, le, uh, i'm a little confused by just that last part so let me just write this so, so right so our, our metric was this ds squared equals minus dt squared plus a of t yeah. squared d s squared now the thing is that if if ds is it represents infinite space then any non-zero scalar multiple of that is still infinite right so i'm a little i'm a little confused uh, by so, what you so, wrote so but ds is some finite um distance so so for a photon, in fact, we know that ds squared is equal to zero. You know, so the like the distance that a light travels, mm -hmm. um, and you know, the dt squared is always equal to c times 
x squared. So you actually get this as a as a dif as a differential equation for what the photon is up to. And then you say, oh, well, the photon is just moving in the x direction because I'm free to move, choose my coordinate system however I want. And so then you wind up with a, um, you know, this is this is telling you like how far the photon has traveled as a function of time. Mm -hmm. And so you drop in your solution for a of t, which is t to the two thirds. You take the take the um, the you know the square root of both sides because you want to get down. And then you've got a dx dt. So if my photon starts at zero, then that's going to be something like. Uh, dx dt that's going to be equal to one over a so you can have like dx is equal to dt over a of t and you do that integral it tells you how far has a photon moved um you know so, you know between t t1 and t2 it tells you how far in, in the coordinate system the photon has moved um but if you can you know because that dt because that scales like t to the two thirds at very late times, you get a different result from what you would have done if you had, if you had something that scaled differently. So the the distance that a photon can cover is going to be a combination of like its actual movement through space, mm. plus the fact that space itself is you know, this, the distance that it's already covered has, has expanded behind it. And so we we wind up with a with an equation for the behavior or the distance that a photon has moved. Um, and the critical thing about this is if we take that two thirds and we integrate this then we get t to the one third and so that's what tells you that a photon has traveled an infinitely small distance at t equals zero because for this particular choice of stuff that we're putting in the universe this integral is is convergent as t goes to zero but if the universe expanded faster than linear then this integral would be divergent as t went to zero Actually, and then we would have essentially an infinite you know that the photon would have started an infinite distance away rather than a than zero distance away. so uh, sure. um well there's two uh, well actually i have two sources of confusion one is just two so this is what we call the horizon by the way yeah so okay this is a so-called horizon and cosmology okay because there's there's this issue of whether uh the the spatial extent of the universe is infinite to begin with because i just think like just, let's just forget about geo for a second right if i just scale if i just scalar multiply Minkowski space by a constant, I'm still going to get infinite space as long as it's non-zero, right? So I was confused about exactly. that part. Exactly. But then there's this other thing about two thirds and one. So let's assume, actually, let me just pause there before we go on. So, so, so it sounded like your analysis that you just talked about still holds even in, in that in that case. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit confused. So you're only looking here at the distance between two points, which is always finite. Yeah, OK. And so the fact that the coordinate system goes off to infinity is not going to bother you. I, I see what you're, you're saying. You're just taking two points. Yeah, and so if you want to say how much of a coordinate, how much, what coordinate distance has a photon traveled since the Big Bang, then the fact that that integral for the case where we've put a universe full of matter that that integral is convergent as t goes to zero tells us I that see. the photon has traveled zero distance at the Big Bang. But if we put in some magical kind of matter, which we can talk about, I mean, depending on how much time we want to spend on this. Sure. If we put in some kind of matter where that where a grows faster than linear, then that integral would diverge as I see as t goes to zero, and then it would look like that. In fact, we could have a photon that started essentially an infinite distance away. Um, and it would still be a photon that had been able to make it to us um, since. You know, so, so we would okay. be able to. The, the 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 piece of the universe that we can see, or the size of the piece of the universe that we can see, is going to depend on how on how that um, equation of motion for a photon is. You know, the how how we how, okay. the, how that behaves, and that depends on what we. That depends on how the universe expands, and that depends on what we put in it, and that depends, I guess, ultimately on its size equation. Okay, I, I see it now. And you're normalizing, I guess, the speed of it's just some constant. Let's say it's one, but basically, I, I've said yeah. so. So we wrote it as sorry, yeah, we I cheated. So we wrote it as um, minus c squared plus yeah. a squared dx squared. Yeah. Um. So I'd 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 set the speed of light equal. To yeah, me. yeah. But the point is that in, in the and, case and that, in the case of this uh two thirds power thing, the point is that at some point the speed of light will be greater. Than the speed of the expansion of the universe is because the derivative of it, t to the two thirds exactly. right for some yeah. for some for some given distance right. between the between those two things we're going to say oh you know that 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 point looks like it's moving away from us faster than the speed of light can we see that point no we can't because a photon that's trying to get to us from that point to us it's actually you know it, no matter how, you know it's running at the speed of light but the the gap is growing faster so we can't there's there are pieces of space that are receding from us faster than the speed of light and you know this is not obviously a violation of 
anything that Einstein ever said because we're using the equations that he wrote down. So you know it can't be. But but the but the but we but the point is is that we can't see those things. We, like anything that's moving away from us faster than the speed of light, it's by definition invisible to us. Right. And so it's that that sort of protects us from paradox in some sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but we're not in that situation with this two uh, t to the two thirds situation. And then, and then, you know, that comes from the fact that we know, you know, we've put in some combination of like the density and the pressure. Um, and when we have that combination of the density and pressure come right, then we get the, um, the, 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 the thing that we expect to have. I see. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, I, okay. So I think uh, we at least cover, uh, we, we've discussed that uh, to my uh, satisfaction, but what about part one, this thing about GR versus QM? Can we really trust the analysis down to the singular? Or how literally should we take it? <laughs> So, so we shouldn't take it all the way down to the singularity. I mean, one of the things you said is that there's no quantum mechanics in this. And so you can get a minimum length and a minimum time by saying, well, how big is a black hole? Or, or like if I make a black hole small enough that its Compton wavelength is smaller than it was the same as its swatched out radius, then at that point, I'm going to have to start worrying about you know, quantum corrections to space time. And so that's this number that we call the Planck length, which is you know 10 to the minus how is it like 33 or 35 meters 10 to the minus or Planck time is 10 to the minus 43 seconds and so you know something that you know a black hole whose event horizon takes light 10 to the minus 43 seconds to cross is going to be um you know smaller than um you know at that point you have to start worrying about just quantum mechanical uncertainty producing non-trivial things in the in the vacuum of space time so from a GR point of view, it looks like you can crunch this down to something very small, but at some point quantum mechanics tells you that that that, that maybe that's not the right way to look at things. Mm. But even bef like well before you get there, it might be you know if you had like string theory or something like that mm. that says you know fundamentally space is ten dimensional, not not four dimensional. Then at some point those extra dimensions become visible, and so there may be there are plenty of ways to have thresholds at which this language breaks. Yeah. At a much higher, um, um, you know, a much larger size or a much later time, than you would get from not, not, you know, t equals, you know, ten to the minus forty-three seconds. But at that point, the actual singularity itself is not something that's, you know, that that's kind of a signpost saying, you know, actually we don't know what's going on here. And so yeah. that, you know, the mystery of what the Big Bang really is, that, you know, what actually happens at t equals zero, then the, the theory in some sense is silent on that. Yeah, I, I guess that that makes sense. Let me go to the next. So in some, back to slide uh, 11. So in some sense, you know, sort of, I guess you have this singularity, I'll just draw like a point, but, and all you're saying, basically saying, okay, if you take the equations literally, uh, the equations make sense literally down to, to t equals zero, uh, there, there, there will be some uh, question about how we can, literally we can take that, but but that's maybe irrelevant because once you get down to this whatever critical uh, size here, new physics comes in and and insofar as we're being physicists concerned about predictions, then uh, the, the, the bulk of the work is trying to explain what is the physics of what's going on at these very small thresholds yeah, that is consistent exactly. and predictive of what we see today. And that's that's good enough. Right, we don't really need to literally yeah, you, go to the You can player, think of it almost right? as an initial conditions problem. Again, yeah, I write my initial conditions problem on some surface. That's right. Um, and then, and then everything I can I can propagate towards using physics that I, I think right. I understand. Right. And, and see what happens. Right. And so, you know, from an observational point of view, we can go back to the point sitting to nuclear synthesis. So the one thing I didn't mention is if is that if you put a universe that's full of photons and not full of rocks, then the photons have pressure as well as density. And so you'd think that the, the universe would expand more rapidly in a universe that has pressure, which is true in some sense. But it's also true that the pressure is diluted by the expansion. So a universe that's full of photons actually has a, like the, ratio, the, the relationship between pressure and density of, and size is different from, and so in fact, what you get is like, like rho for, for photons. It goes like one over eight of the fourth. Whereas rho, so rho photons, whereas rho matter goes like one over a cubed. Hmm. And so in our universe, we know that we've got the microwave background, which is this bath of photons. And we know that the density of the energy density of those photons drops away more rapidly than the energy density of, of the stars and galaxies of the kind of rocks, if you want to think of them as that. Um, and so where that gets you, or physically what's happening is that 
the photons are redshifted by the expansion of the universe. And so the number density of photons stays constant in a co-moving volume in a, in, a, in a box, you know, in an expanding box. But the energy of each photon is, um, is being diluted um, as, as it expands. And so the, the density of the radiation in the universe gets expanded away faster than the density of matter in the universe. And so when we go back into the very early universe, the opposite is true. And so the early universe is dominated not by, by atoms or by, you know, sort of the imaginary pressureless billiard balls, whatever you want to describe them, but will be dominated by radiation and will be super hot. And so in the early universe, we have you know, predictions that, you know, that nuclear reactions take place, you know, minutes after the Big Bang. And so we, we have the thermal history of the universe. So we have the <laughs> thermal history of the universe that, 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 um, that is laid down on top of this. And so in fact, both of all of the arguments about causality and the expansion work just as well for radiation and matter. But it turns out that our universe contains a mixture of matter and radiation that, that um, the radiation is, is much, you know, the, the contribution to the density of the universe today is much smaller. In the very early universe, it would have been much larger. And therefore, the, early, the Big Bang was not only dense, but also it was extremely hot. And so this idea that you have the hot Big Bang is something that you get from the 40s, um, you know, from Gamow and people. Um, that, and, you know, that you can have nuclear reactions that took place immediately after the Big Bang. I think maybe the next thing we can talk about is the topic of inflation. So I brought up some questions about the Big Bang, uh, but of course there are going to be many issues uh, surrounding the Big Bang and, and, and some of its shortcomings. I don't think I probably raised any that were particular to what inflation addresses. Maybe you can tell me what, what are some of the problems that are within the scope of inflation and then how does inflation actually resolve some of those? So we, we sort of got there. We started talking about the, the initial conditions. So what is the, mm. you know, what is the initial state of the universe? And the fact is, is that, you know, we can see like progressively, we can see more and more of the universe as, as the universe, as the universe gets bigger. And so at the moment I'm ignoring dark energy and I'm also ignoring um, uh, the, the, you know, the, some of the complexities about the early universe, but, but um, you know, dark, en dark energy changes the future. It doesn't, it doesn't change the past. Um, and so where that gets us is that um, the, the, um, if we want to know what the initial state of the universe was, then with each passing moment, you can see a piece of the universe that we couldn't see previously, you know, because, because the, you know, initially a photon can travel zero distance because of the convergence of this integral, what we call the horizon, co-moving horizon size is zero. And so as time goes on, the co-moving horizon size gets bigger and bigger and like new pieces of the universe kind of become visible to us. And when that happens, as far as we can tell, each piece of the universe that becomes visible to us is pretty much the same on average as the pieces that we've already got. And so then the question becomes, well, what sets the initial conditions of the universe in such a way? And so once you get past that initial singularity, you've got an infinite universe. And it seems that the universe was somehow correlated across that, in, you know, across that entire initial hypersurface in ways that um, you know are entirely ignorant of anything to do with causality and so that that's the essence of this of the initial conditions problem that we face there's another there's a bunch of different ways of thinking about it um, one of them is that if we just take the microwave background and we and we extrapolate it back into the infinite past um, it looks like it reaches the Planck temperature you know the point at which it would be, um, you know, reach the energy scale that corresponds to the Planck length um, much, much earlier than it looks like that the density, you know, that the universe itself, if we say, you know, how long, how much bigger does the universe have to get um, for the, you know, until everything that's visible today would have fitted into one Planck volume. One of those numbers is about 10 to the 30 times different from the other. In other words, the, the present temperature of the microwave background is about 10 to the 30 times below the Planck temperature. But the present size of the universe is about 10 to the 60 times bigger than the Planck length. And so then there's kind of a mismatch there. And there's lots of different ways of talking about it. So Weinberg, certainly in the 1970s, Steve Weinberg had, had you know, wrote a general relativity text where he went into some of the problems of the early, uni or of early universe cosmology that, that related to what we call these initial conditions problems. And it was in the early, uh, there's actually a handful of people who can claim to have invented this in some ways. Like um, uh, there's a Katsuhiko Sato who's a was a professor in Tokyo, 
um, Alexei Starobinsky, a bunch of people have all kind of got different versions of this that now what we would call inflation. But the person who really put his finger on it was Alan Ghost. And he, very, he wrote this very, very clear paper where he said, you know, that if we had this phase in the early universe where the expansion of the universe is not decelerating, but accelerating, then we can solve all of these initial conditions problems. And the way we solve them essentially is we take the, the um, like in, an, in a universe that's growing faster than linearly, then pieces of the universe that were visible to us yesterday will be invisible to us tomorrow because those pieces are now far enough away that they will be accelerating away from us faster than the speed of light. And so the volume of the universe that we can see starts out you know, infinite in terms of these co-moving coordinates, becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then eventually, if, it, if that goes on for long enough, then we get to a point where everything that we can see today would have lived inside of a tiny region right after the, you know, whatever we call the Big Bang. And so you can all of these kind of um, you know, problems that would come up with, you know, how do we get the universe correlated on large scales? They all go away because the universe only needed to be correlated on in, in some tiny initial region. And the key thing that you need for inflation is that you need, for that to happen, you need this faster than linear expansion or accelerated expansion. And if you get that, then you, then you have inflation. Hmm. And so that, he, the way that Goose came to it is that he was looking at what happens if you have um, a configuration of a quantum field that has a, quant a constant density. And so as the universe expands, the density stays constant. And so the density of the universe is not decreasing. It doesn't, it doesn't get diluted by the expansion of the universe because it's a, a field configuration that just gets stretched infinitely rather than individual little chunks of matter whose, whose density is diluted by the, by the expansion of the universe. Sorry, so, so, you're, so, in that so, you're so you're hypothesizing, so you're hypothesizing a field who's, uh, whatever. So, so you actually, we saw it here. You have these, these rows that are proportional to different powers of a. So then you've got row inflation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Which is like maybe constant or, or something that, yeah. So one, okay. one over constant is probably the easiest, or just constant, I guess. Okay, okay, right. sure, okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, <laughs> I see, okay. Uh, yeah. uh, constant. Uh -huh. And so the problem you have is that once you get into that scenario, then everything else in the universe gets diluted away by this expansion. So the other thing inflation does for you, if you make any kind of mess, like you know primordial black holes, you know these kind of imaginary particles called monopoles, which correspond to, you know, like, like isolated you know ends of a magnet you know that can potentially exist in grand unified theories you know all of those things you know like babies are messy i guess and so a baby universe you know could have all of this kind of stuff inside of it and so what it looks like is when we look at our universe you know this baby was like it's like the photo that you've had taken by a photographer that makes your baby look like kind of clean and you know shiny and <laughs> sorry, sorry, I, uh, wait, 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 sorry we might be wandering in too many directions but i thought you couldn't have magnetic monopoles uh, already from maxwell's equations uh, but no we, well, so, so there are, in some grand unified field theories there are there are there are monopoles you, you can have monopoles um that that, that they, so max like at, at, at low energy electromagnetism has no monopoles that's true but in some grand unified theories, particularly the ones that were popular in the early 1980s, they, they were monopole. Oh, I'm gonna and guess. So, I'm gonna guess it's because yeah. you're you're you 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 have a different gauge group, right? Not U1, and so you can yeah. Have... So these are more complicated gauge groups, and yeah. the particles themselves are massive and stable because they've got um you know let's say let's say meet each other, and so it looked like there was at least theories in which they were prolifically created in the early universe. Hmm. Um, and then you'd have all of these really massive stable particles that should be the dominant content mm. of the universe today. And of course, mm. they're, they're not. Mm -hmm. And so anything that produces stuff that in the early universe that's stable and long-lived and massive should still be here today. And so the challenge is to explain why none of that stuff has happened. Mm. And inflation, mm. like whatever kind of remnant, whatever kind of mess you've got left over from the Big Bang itself, which is not necessarily a, you know, a smooth process, all of the, anything that's left over will be smoothed away by this period of very rapid expansion. Mm. So it, it resets the initial conditions of the universe after whatever the Big Bang was and sort of puts all of everything that the Big Bang itself put, kind of puts it behind a curtain. Mm. And so this corresponds to something that has, um, you know, that, who's the dilution, the, the way in which the stuff, whatever drives it, has to be diluted less rapidly than, the, you know, than, than anything else. Okay. The two equations that we want here are firstly this guy. And this guy says that if I want the density to be constant, then I want the pressure 
and units where the speed of light is equal to one. I want the pressure and the, or the energy density. I want that to be, I want those numbers to be equal and opposite. In other words, I want, I want <laughs> negative pressure mm -hmm. and I want its magnitude to be the same as the density. When that happens, right. this bracketed term vanishes. Yep. This vanishes and that says that rho dot is equal to zero so mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. density of the universe doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the way that you can imagine that is that pressure is something that does work on its surroundings. So if I take a, you know, a, um, you know, if I take a, a cylinder and I push the, the, you know, push it, you know, compress it, then when the pressure inside of that, it, it does work by lifting the, by lifting the cylinder back up. And so, you know, like work has been done and that's positive pressure. But if I take something like a rubber band and I, I stretch it, then I stored energy in it and it would release in, you know, would do work on its environment by, by contracting. And so if you, if you stretch some, you know, if you store energy in something, you're also increasing its mass. And so if you have, you can have configurations of quantum fields that as you stretch them, the, the local configuration stays essentially unchanged so that the density doesn't change, but that corresponds to a negative pressure. It, it, you're actually storing energy in the configuration as it expands. And so its energy density stays roughly constant. And so this is like, I mean, energy, negative, negative pressure sounds a little wacky, but it's not nearly as wacky as something like negative mass. You know, it's, it's something that can happen. It's just a question of whether you store energy in it by by expansion or contraction. So are there, so normally yeah, we, are there are there any uh, uh, ordinary uh, situations in which one has <laughs> negative pressure or negative mass? Just uh, not neg think. negative mass is something truly weird because that would have you know repulsive gravity and it violates all kinds of the theorems in GR. Mm -hmm. Negative pressure, um, yeah, I think I mean there are quantum situations I think where you can. You know, generate this on micro scales. The key thing here is that you're generating as much negative, pre you know, the pressure and the mass are the same as each other, and the and, and units where the speed of light is equal to one. And so, if I take a rubber band and I stretch it, arguably the negative pressure, but the amount of energy that I'm storing in that rubber band is tiny compared to the amount of to, to the mass, you know, to the to the rest energy of the atom. So I'm not going to see it's 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 Sorry, mass. How should I, I how should I intuitively think about the sign of pressure i mean like you know sort of the sign of temperature is intuitive in that you know hot heat flows from uh, uh yeah, high temperature yeah. to low temperature how, do, how should i think of positive versus negative pressure uh, so positive versus negative pressure i think at some level you can just say do i do you know if i expand do i contribute energy to my environment or oh, I do see. i store energy in myself as i expand ah right because because right because uh uh that's right right because the change in energy we could write this thermodynamically right the the change in uh energy like d du is you know dq plus plus or minus depending on your convention pdv right so it's just exactly exactly, what, exactly. And, and like right. am i gonna you know do i do I, if i if i give a negative dv do i get a positive or a negative contribution to got DV? it got it okay. and so that's not super but the wacky thing is is then when i look here um you can see that the the if i take the you know, I take the derivative of, the, of this equation, I get something that's got a double dot in it. And so I'm able to move everything around and I get an equation that looks like this. And it says that whenever, I'll make that three more clear. If I've got something where the pressure is more, you know, is, is more negative than one third of the energy density, then the, um, the, the acceleration is going to be positive. You know, this, this mm. quantity will be, you know, this quantity in the brackets is negative. There's a minus sign, so this acceleration is mm. a double dot is positive, and so so that corresponds to what I need to get an accelerated expansion. Since, now, uh -huh. since the the is there is this is this the, was this the first example in which something has negative pressure? Because it seems a little bit contrived in, in that sense. It's like okay, something normal is positive. Now you say it's negative because it makes something work. But is that is that is there a good, so better the reason? That, the way that Goose came to it was by looking at a field configuration that had these properties and then realizing that it would do this for the cosmology. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. So, so he was like, oh, wow, this, you know, this is, I'm, I'm looking at these, um, the, it's, you know, solutions where like a field gets trapped at a particular value that corresponds to a particular local energy. So he looks at that and says, oh, it's going to make my universe expand. What's it going to do for these other problems? And in fact, some of them that he, you know, it's a way that he tells the story that he, you know, recently heard about in a seminar, you know, it wasn't like he was working in cosmology. He, he came to this realization from the perspective of like thinking about field, these 
quantum field configuration I see. in the early universe. I see. And then, um, and then realize that they solved this collection of problems, in particular that they just take a tiny amount of universe and then they blow it up to a much larger size and then it mm -hmm. solves the, the, the problem that you have in explaining why um, the, 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 um, you know, why it is that the universe is apparently correlated on very large scales. Mm. If it, you know, relative to what you would assume if you just take a, you know, matter dominated universe or a radiation dominated universe. And so, so maybe I'm jumping ahead here, but is, is now the, okay, so let, let's just assume that we posit there is something that has negative pressure, then is the job to find a more fundamental set of physical, uh, 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 more fundamental physical description, say, coming from quantum field theory, from which negative pressure could actually emerge? Yeah, that's that's pretty. I mean, so 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 Goose. I mean, people had access to these because they had access to like a like a quantum field that has a potential that looks like this. For instance, you know, the field is assumed to have the same value at every point in space, and it wants to the field wants to roll. You know, rolls down the hill. It has a field equation that says it, but then it gets to this local minimum and it gets stuck, and so it can't evolve any further. But you've got some local energy density that's given by this. And this is going to be your, you know, the, the energy density of every point in space time. It's constant. And so it just drives this, this exponential period of expansion. And this was the version of this that, that Guth found. But it also turns out that if you start up like a long way up the hill and you just kind of roll slowly, um, and this was something that was realized by Linde and others a few years later, um, that if the, in the right kind of potential, then you roll slowly enough here so that the energy density changes slowly enough so that you wind up with a negative pressure anyway. You don't need the special trapping. Um, oh, sorry. So, so the zero, the zero is some horizontal line above that minimum. Or what? Uh, sorry. So, so the zero of energy is here. It's, it's down the bottom. Ah, I um, see. So where's so the... the the true minimum is here? But but like as a as a kind of evolutionary, you know, as an evolutionary trajectory, like like if you start off at a, if you start off the field at a high enough value, then as it rolls towards the the bottom of the potential. It rolls slowly enough so that its density changes slowly enough so that it has negative pressure. Oh, sorry. What's rather the than positive pressure. What's the what's the relationship between pressure and and this potential energy? So the uh, so so the so so really what you're getting from this is just how fast is the density changing in some sense? You know, like okay. how long does it take me to to roll from here to here? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the behavior of the field depends like is slowed down by the expansion of the universe. The, expanding universe exerts a kind of friction in the field dynamics that wouldn't be present if you turn if you turn gravity off mm. so this is getting and so then you can look at this scenario and you can say oh if i compute the pressure for this scenario then the pressure is appropriately negative and so you want you can start off by looking for something that's change whose density changes very slowly as the universe expands and then that will necessarily have a negative pressure, or you can look for something that has a negative pressure and then show that that, that will give you the sorry, expansion. So are you saying that that, that uh, there is a, a bit of a complicated story underlying this picture, whereby if you understand the dynamics uh, of this uh, field with regards to this so potential well, yeah. then, then the dynamics that emerges is equivalent to having negative pressure? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. okay. And, and the key thing about, or the key thing about this is that this problem here is that like, okay, that's great. I've solved my initial conditions problem and the universe is now expanding exponentially, but I'm going to need to turn it off at some point because, because, you know, the universe isn't full of stuff, you know, a little bit below the Planck scale expanding exponentially. It's, you know, it's full of atoms and stars and, and the rest of it. And so, so this, this version here doesn't actually work because you need it to be able to come to an end, what they call the graceful exit problem. Hmm. And so this, this version here, it turns out where you're on the right-hand side and you're just kind of rolling towards the minimum. The, in that case, the, 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 um, once you get low enough in the potential, it turns out that the, the friction term becomes small. And then it turns out that the, um, the, the, the oscillations about this point have positive pressure rather than negative pressure and you're able to get at least to the point where the exponential or near exponential expansion has come to a halt and then you wind up with a universe that's very dense but also um and then you have to have some additional mechanism that takes the energy that's stored in this field and turns it into the you know fields that are made out of standard model particles and it's that last step actually that is, is not in any inflationary model pretty much is not well understood hmm. so there's this kind of i mean all of the inflation remodels we've got are proposals or hypotheses 
there's nothing that sits inside of, you know, like our understanding of particle physics and says, oh yeah, that's definitely the bit that drives inflation. Whatever it is, it's something that lives beyond, you know, there's not something we've ever seen, you know, at the LHC or, or, or you know, it's some, some new set of quantum fields, some new set of material that exists. But at least in principle, this gives you a, a language for explaining how it is that I can have like a, a universe of Friedman or Robertson, you know, or Robertson Walker or the Matra would have described, you know, back in the 1920s and get um, something, you know, by taking that evolutionary history of the universe and then grafting this, um, this, this kind of extra expansionary phase onto that history with this extra stuff that we don't know what it is, but, you know, we hypothesize, we know that it could exist. Um, then you can wind up with something that that, that seems to ameliorate these initial condition mm. problems right. as so, well as the um, yeah. So let's take a step back. So actually, it sounds like uh, so so we had this issue about how to get uh, you know this uh, uh, negative pressure p, and that yeah. was that was a purely gr uh, you know variable setting. Now we have this quantum field theoretic framework, which involves quantum field theory and quantum fields. <laughs> And then it seems like there's like a bit of a, a, a maybe that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I just want to kind of get the story straight that there's this kind of quantum field theory module that that sort of you, you don't have to know anything about GR. You just do quantum field theory. Then that suggests for you that there is this negative pressure. And then you just sort of set that aside and then plug that back into GR. You actually never need to fuse the GR and the and the quantum field yeah, theory, no, right? No, like it, one one's it, just like this feeding to the other. Is that right? Little, yeah. It, at this level, you're just doing classical field theory. You're just oh, taking oh. a classical. The point at which it becomes quantum mechanical is two ways. Firstly, the place, places people look for these potentials are in theories of fundamental particle physics, which mm. are kind of born quantum in some sense. Mm. And the second way it's quantum mechanical is that you're also worried about the perturbations that are generated um, in the field quantum mechanically during inflation. Mm. And those, like if, if, if you know, Planck's constant was zero, then those perturbations wouldn't exist. Mm. And it turns out the, the quantum mechanical wiggling and the value of the field, that eventually becomes, those become the seeds for the, you know, if the universe, if, if it wasn't for quantum mechanics, inflation would make the universe perfectly smooth. And it's not perfectly smooth, and it's just a little bit less than perfectly smooth because you want to be able to create galaxies. Mm. And, um, you know, the hot and cold spots that we see in the microwave background, all of those have to come from someplace. And so the, the inflation solves the kind of first order initial conditions problem by getting rid of any inhomogeneity. And then you have to break that inhomogeneity or break that homogeneity just ever so slightly in order to see the formation of galaxies and the structure we see in the microwave background at the time when we see it happen. You know, if the universe was perfectly smooth, you might have to wait, you know, billions and billions of years for, for you know, any structure to form at all. But we know the galaxies form pretty promptly after the, um, you know, after after the, the, after after the, well, essentially after matter becomes able to collapse, which is when when the universe becomes matter dominated. Hmm. I'm trying to think of, uh, by what you just said, something being slightly asymmetrical. Is this is this something to do with uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, or is it because it's not a not a free field and there's some some small perturbation? you're doing around a free field? Um, so, so the spontaneous symmetry breaking, um, so these can be field, I mean, I mean, I mean, the fact that these are most easily imagined with scalar fields. And so we know that things like the Higgs, for instance, which is a scalar field is associated with spontaneous symmetry breaking. So the, the kind of direction that you pick, you know, if you've got some complicated set of fields and you choose a particular trajectory, then that would correspond to a spontaneous symmetry breaking. But the quantum mechanics of this, then the quantum mechanical arguments we see about the kind of wiggling of the field, that applies even just in a perfect, um, uh, you know, like a, a, just a single massive field that is, has no self-interactions would still would still be subject to this kind of quantum mechanical jiggling. Hmm. I'm, try, I'm trying to think what that... So there's the yeah. quantum mechanics of kind of deep particle physics, and then there's also the quantum mechanics of just like any field in a very dense universe, it turns out, is going, oh, to, I see. going to fluctuate slightly. Right. I mean, what's particular about quantum mechanics is that you have non-commuting operators and their failure commutivity is proportional to h bar. You're saying that h bar not being zero is, is, is what's causing uh, this. Yeah. If you, if you you can say, like, which parts of this would be true if h bar was equal to zero? And so you can still get, like, like, the fact that inflation is going to wipe everything out and drive an expanding universe. That can be true with h bar equals zero. But then if you want to say, but actually, I don't want a perfectly flat universe. I want one that's 
ever so slightly not flat and in a quite a you know like a particular way then you then you have to turn h bar on to to make that happen i see okay okay um uh, great okay so so um oh I, th maybe this is the point where we can um go I into to grab getting... it to, yeah because because you met you did mention one thing which was and maybe this now we'll get to bicep too because you said there's nothing about the lhc that's going to uh pinpoint uh inflation right so maybe this is the point right. to say what will corroborate inflation and this that precisely was what bicep two so was trying to do there's right several parts to this so the first thing is is like as i said there's nothing in the standard model of particle physics that is able to generate a you know a configuration of matter that would provide us with the kind of you know the kind of negative pressure that we need to do this mm. so you know we have the higgs which is as close as we get because it's a scalar particle but it's not it doesn't have the right well, at least the the minimal Higgs doesn't have the right potential and properties that we need to do this. So whatever it is that drive, if inflation happens, whatever it is that makes inflation happens is some piece of particle physics that we don't currently understand. And so then we say, well, probably it's at energies beyond the energies that we can probe at the LHC. And the simplest models of inflation, it turns out they have an energy that corresponds to an energy about a trillion times higher than the sorts of interactions that we see at the LHC. <laughs> so, mm. so, so you've gone from like, you know, like like this would be a, you know to scale the LHC up to to that kind of energy. You know, you'd be it would be as big as the solar system or something like that. It would be. There's no there's no easy experiment easy way to get kind of terrestrial experimental access to, to those energies that we can see, and so these are the kind of energies that people talk about for what they call grand unified theories, and and for a variety of reasons those look like a natural place to look for the inflationary, the physics that would drive inflation. So if you could prove that inflation had definitely happened in the universe, then potentially you're also getting access to physics that, um, that that's just almost inconceivably beyond the kinds of energies that we can probe in direct terrestrial experiments. So you've, you've kind of gone into the sort of casino of theoretical physics and you've said, not only do I want to understand like everything and you know like what all of the interactions are in nature what all of the particles i could have but on top of that i also want to explain how the universe began and why it looks the way that it does today and so you you know <laughs> i see i, I hope this isn't know, a yeah theoretical physics kind of stalls but now you've kind of doubled I down see. and said actually yeah. no i'm going to reach much higher energy but i want to solve two big problems at once yeah you know? and, and then that that's not a um that's not an unarrogant yeah. move, I guess. I see. Although <laughs> this is probably a, a whole topic itself, but but I, this is probably one of the entry points for where Sabine Hassenfeller has le levied a bunch of her criticisms uh, against physics, right? All these uh, models, parameters, and, and things being underdetermined. So, so no, it's, 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 yeah. I mean, particularly with inflation, it turns out that it's very easy to write down specific inflationary models and then work out their consequences and publish them. And so I don't think it's as true as it used to be. I think, I mean, that's not something that you could get tenure doing today, but certainly in the early nineties, you could come up with some wacky model of inflation and you could write about it and you could explain why it was different from others. You calculate its observable consequences in terms of the particular mix of perturbations that you got. And, and, and you could have got tenure doing that. And so it's, it's at some point, at some point, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the incentivization of the proliferate specific models rather than sort of broader paradigms, I think is definitely something that, that um, and, you know, you can always invent a new model, you know, so, so, and the model's not testable immediately, but, you know, will be testable five years from now, you know, so, so there's, there's no, there's no, there's no limitation on the kinds of model building that you can do. And then the question becomes, well, to some extent that's informative because it tells me what kinds of models I can build with what assumptions. But at some point, you know, like once you've got N models contributing the N plus once model has to have something special about it to be interesting. And, and I feel that the field is actually, I mean, I, I'm aware of like the criticism that Sabine makes. I feel that the field is, is, is sort of aware of the value of that kind of work um, and, and kind of discounts it accordingly. But I think it's probably on a time scale that, that, um, you know that that people who are more critical may not, you know, may think that we should just just stop. You know that no one should no no one should do this. You know, that we should shun people from doing this. <laughs> I see, I see. Okay. <laughs> and 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 that has, you know and and this will happen with the, with this recent news about the W boson, you know, having mass being slightly different mm. from what people expect. Mm. You know, you can generate an infinite number of theories that would potentially explain that. And I imagine that people you know will keep themselves. You know, I mean that 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 will provide, you know 
distraction and activity for a lot of people for some time to come. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, but so 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 so. Okay, so it sounds like if you wanted to do a, a front on assault on how to measure inflation, you're pretty screwed because you just can't probe the fundamental constituents that lead to inflation. So it sounds like you have to do some kind of derivative experiment, uh, indirect so experiment, one, right? Or what? There's one, well, the one um, kind of counterexample to that is it turns out as well as producing, so inflation produces density perturbations like the universe, the end of inflation is just you know, different in density by parts in 10 to the five as you move around. And you can say, well, you know, I take a Fourier transform of that and I know what the spectrum of that, you know, like the longer wavelength modes have slightly more power than the shorter wavelength modes. And I can measure how much, you know, by how much that is. But the other thing that you do is you also kind of the same quantum mechanical process also also causes like space time itself to fluctuate slightly. And so this is kind of arguably a quantum gravitational effect, but it's a low energy quantum gravitational effect and you can do it without having a kind of a full theory of quantum gravity. But it's the same, the same argument that gives you the perturbations in the fields gives you the perturbations in space time. And those perturbations survive into the present day as well, it looks like a background of gravitational waves. And so it puts the universe in a bath of gravitational waves. And that bath of gravitational waves exists on every wavelength from you know, this size, literally, to the stretch to like across the visible universe. And the reason you can do that is because the universe has been, if it wasn't for inflation, it wasn't for this phase of stretching, you would have had little local gravitational waves that were generated. But you wouldn't have. But the fact that you've had this long, you know, this period of stretching during inflation means. Can you can you briefly or at least qualitatively describe what a, a gravitational wave is? Is is it, it can, can, is it so simple as you know, uh, here's here's my metric d s squared, and then there's maybe like <laughs> d s let's call it zero for my usual, and then there's like maybe some yeah. gravitational wave part that's a perturbation that's causing some fluctuation around that. Is it is it that then, naive? Listen, so 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 that's exactly and and what it does is the gravitational waves will mix up the off diagonal parts to the metric and the way that the the, oh, I see. the the density perturbations only need to live in the diagonal parts of the metric but the gravitational waves mix up the off diagonal parts and they do it in an interesting way that's if you look at like okay that, that is interesting but they also ah. do it in a way that when you're stretching in this direction you're necessarily getting pulled in i was just i direction. was just thinking about that picture yeah because that's exactly what these and off diagonal terms do are doing this, yeah, yeah 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 and then when you do this you you, you you get this kind of and there's a there's a second polarization that that, that mm-hmm. looks like this mm. so so they have two polar and so so it's this correlated um stretching in one direction uh you know contraction in one direction with stretching in the orthogonal direction and because it's a wave you know those those two states will, will and so so this is why the ligo is kind of l shape i see because so th- this this direction will will be you know, will be st- if this direction yeah. is being stretched, then this direction is being. Con- I see. I should think. I should think of these as longitudinal waves, right? Where they kind of like go like this. I guess I was. I was thinking waves no, so, are more so, like so, like so, this. So the way. So so the the um the gravitational waves are, tra- are transverse. They're, they're 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 orthogonal to the direction of propagation. Hmm. Um, and and so so so, but they have this. You know, but they but they're disturbances in space time itself. Mm. Whereas if I have a wave and matter, then I've got some stuff that I put in the universe and I propagate it through the universe and it's the stuff that's been wobbled. Mm. Whereas this is a prop, this is a, a, a disturbance that lives entirely in the, in the, in the space time. Yeah, I see. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think it's, and, it, it's, it's the picture you drew. It's sort of more con- visually coherent to think of it as, as, as longitudinal, but of course this is misleading because this is a yeah, distortion yeah, yeah. of so, space so, versus so distortion like, of it's matter. Like, it's yeah. like, it's like, yeah. it's like this, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyways. All right. All right. Um, okay. So, so what happens is, is that happens independently of the inflationary mechanism. It just depends on the energy that you're at. When the, the higher the energy, the closer you are to the Planck scale, the greater the amplitude of these gravitational waves that you develop. Hmm. And the way that we see them, or the way that we can pick them up, would be firstly just in an interferometer. I mean, LIGO, for what it, complicated reasons, doesn't have the right sensitivity. But you could imagine building a, an interferometer in space that was very sensitive to what we call a stochastic or an all sky background and avoided a frequency band where there was other things going on and you couldn't measure that. But no one, no one's done that yet. Mm. The other way to see it is in the microwave background because that tells us that the early universe was ionized. And so if there are gravitational waves propagating through the microwave background when it's ionized, you're squeezing the material slightly in this direction and stretching it slightly in this direction. And that means that you get this 
very specific polarization pattern imprinted on the microwave background at the point at which um, it, the unit, you know, at, at the universe is ionized, which is 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And then that 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 um, pattern doesn't change, or you know, is locked because the gravi because the microwave background then propagates towards us, or you know, in every direction since since the, the universe becomes uh, homogeneous. Then you can look at the microwave background, or you look at its polarization, and you can say, oh, I can see this pattern of polarization in the microwave background that wouldn't be there if I didn't have this background of you know, you know, correlated stretching and squeezing. That had been going on in the universe at a time when the universe was ionized, um, mm. you know, which is which is hundreds of thousands of years. After oh, we, we didn't we didn't talk about but the, so so uh, the cosmic uh, microwave uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, microwave yeah, yeah. just fill uh, wave uh, uh, background. Um, I was uh, I was trying to th uh, think of a nice way to visualize this, but but uh, uh, but you know it, it was it's basically like a relic of when the f universe first became transparent to photons, right? So and so so. so uh, what it is is if you look at the sky, it turns out that the sky is slightly warm, you know, right. 2.7 degrees above absolute or 2.7 Kelvin, so 2.7 degrees Celsius above absolute zero. And so what that corresponds to is that corresponds to a density of photons that from memory is like a billion photons per cubic meter or something like that. And then you say, well, like as the universe contracts, or you know, if you ran the universe back into the past, each of those photons has a smaller wavelength because they get expanded by the you know, the redshift that comes from the expansion of the universe. So the universe gets hotter. So the early universe, you know, when it's a thousand times smaller, it's two points, it's 2,700 Kelvins, not 2.7 Kelvins. If it's a billion times smaller, then it's um, 2 billion Kelvins. And, you know, eventually you get to the point where, you know, nuclear reactions can happen. And so the, at, at about, at a 2,000 Kelvins, the, the hydrogen in the universe there's an because there's so many more photons than protons the tail of the maxwell boltzmann distribution is energetic enough to ionize hydrogen um or the you know the the, the Planck distribution rather that, that that describes the the you know the distribution of um uh you know energies in the in this photon gas and so that distribution say you know that at that point the universe becomes um a plasma and then pho the photons can't propagate in a straight line through a plasma they're coupled you know they're coupled directly to this plasma and so it's only when the universe cools to the point where the most of the electrons are coupled to most of the protons in the universe that it becomes transparent and, and the mean three parts of the photon becomes becomes essentially infinite mm. and so it's at that point when we look at the microwave background what we're really looking at is photons that last interacted with the universe a few hundred uh, barring uh, some technicalities that i'm going to skate over but a few hundred thousand years after the big bang and so they tell you what the universe looked like a few hundred thousand years after the big bang i, I, I was just trying to think, know what the universe looks like today okay i was trying to think of like a very like uh, a palpable analogy so i was trying to think suppose i were uh, in an infinitely large sauna right and then and then all of a sudden the steam started uh you know the sauna started cooling or whatever or, or <laughs> becoming more diffuse until finally it be I I, I I i reached a point of visibility so with the cmb be this um constantly changing uh, uh, um, back, uh, signal I get based on uh, how far I can see into this steam room where like, the, you know, based on how far light has traveled to me, uh, based, you know, where I can sort of see furthest. Is that, is that would that be like a, yeah, it's like, a, a I mean, analogous? The material, it's like if you took the steam room and you chilled it, then suddenly the, the air in the room would condense, right. you know, steam in the room would condense into water droplets. Right. And the water droplets would be, you know, would like, uh, you know, you they're, they're taking up less space, and you can kind of see through them, I guess. Whereas right. if it's steam, you know, everything's kind of diffuse and fun. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'll have to. I wouldn't want to. Wouldn't want necessarily to trust my way to that. Okay. <laughs> On the basis of ten seconds, <laughs> but it's very much that the universe goes from being being opaque to photons to right. being suddenly, or relatively suddenly, transparent. Right. And what I was saying is that because this uh, sauna is infinite, right? Like that, like. Uh, uh, information can only reach me in a finite amount of time. So there will be a point far enough away, depending on how much time has elapsed, where I still see the last moment where there was still yeah, steam. Yeah, exactly. So right? we, that's what I'm trying so to say. So if you yeah. look far enough away back into the universe, right. then then um, then what you're seeing is the is the, is the the unionized. I'm mm -hmm. oh, sorry, you're seeing the ionized universe. And so you're right. seeing the point. Yeah. And so, so, so it's almost like, in fact, being like an inside out star. Because when we look far enough back into the universe, what we're seeing is this hot plasma. 
Mm -hmm. And the only reason it doesn't look hot is because it because of the redshift that's been applied. Yeah, to I was gonna say the, the one the, the, the one part or there's probably many parts, but the <laughs> part where my sauna analogy fails is the fact that I uh, I don't get this like temperature difference of oh if I looked at what the steam room was very far away I'm still gonna like maybe get a sense of how hot it was, but because of this this redshift there is a temperature. Uh, uh, differential as a result of, of this distance as well. Yeah, I think that, I think that's exactly right. And and uh, the the key thing that happens for for the you know like like if I look at a galaxy that are, you know that's five billion light years away, then I'm also looking in some sense at a galaxy that the light has taken five billion years to reach me. And so if I look at very distant galaxies, I'm also looking at the universe as it was when it was much younger than it is today. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we actually have this ability to, to, um, to, you know, to look back in time um, that we don't, you know, that, that, that we wouldn't have if it wasn't, again, because of this causality. And so when we look at the microwave background, we're looking back in time to the point that the universe was, was hundreds of thousands of years old. Mm -hmm. And so this is why people talk about it as, you know, the baby photo of the universe. And, and the specific thing that you look for is not just the temperature of the microwave background, but also that the light that's coming from it is slightly polarized in a, in a very specific way that corresponds to the imprint of these, these primordial yeah. gravitational waves. And, and, and I guess, I guess just, to, just to connect back with the equations we were looking at before, there, there has to be a certain set of, um, how do I say, let me start over. It, it, if you had, uh, defined the parameters of the universe in such a way that you could see all of the universe. Like for example, suppose the universe were actually positively curved and expanded slowly. You couldn't mm -hmm. at some point see the entire universe because it's, it's just sufficiently small, right? So, so we live in a situation where uh, we actually can't see everything. There is this sort of uh, horizon that we do see that's very old. We have to be careful with the finish. We have to be careful with the curvature thing, but it's certainly true that we can't, we only see a finite volume of the universe. Right. Yeah. And and the key thing is is the fact that the if it wasn't for inflation, then the most distant parts of the universe would only just have become invisible to us. We'd never have seen them before. But if because of because of this phase of inflation, then there are you can have correlated disturbances that stretch from one side of the universe to another, mm -hmm. including these 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 gravitational waves whose amplitude we can calculate. And know that it's just a, that just depends on the den or how dense the universe was during inflation, whereas the some of the other properties of the universe depend on the kind of details of the inflationary phase. Mm -hmm. So if inflation happens at a high enough energy in the early universe, then you get this spectrum of gravitational this, this background of gravitational waves that we can detect. I see. In now, inter interesting, actually. So so yeah. So how do I say? Um, so I okay. So 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 is this a true statement that if if a uh, bicep to say detected gravitational waves of a certain form, then that would set sort of a, uh, a lower bound on sort of like the strength of inflation. And therefore in, in particular that it had exactly. to occur, occur so, right? So, so, yeah, yeah. And there's a huge debate in the theory community as to whether inflation has to happen at a very high energy, in which case the presence of the, the absence of the gravitational wave background then says that probably inflation didn't happen. Or whether it can happen at a very high energy but doesn't absolutely need to in which case if you see the gravitational wave background because you just there's no other kind of known mechanism that would produce it if you see the gravitational wave background then that proves that inflation happened ah. but if you don't see it it doesn't prove that it doesn't uh, sorry it, so, probably, it probably goes it probably goes both ways right because well okay sorry so let, let's actually write this down so if you see if you see gravitational waves then there's you know there's evidence for inflation and, and you're saying but if you no don't see if you don't see gravitational waves or, oh okay all right you want to draw it that way so <laughs> nice nice okay so let this me, this, let me this like like everyone would agree like like that this one is like if you're living in here okay then then it's very hard you like you see gravitational waves you like these, these two things imply each other. Okay. If you have inflation, but you don't have gravitational waves, then that's, that seems like it's still possible. Although there are people who would say that the expectation is, is if you don't see gravitational waves, then you have to stop thinking that inflation probably happened or you have to consider other options. Um, and if you don't, I guess, but this one's sort of like, we just don't know what to do with that. 
Um, and then on the other hand, it also seems like you can't live in this region. We don't, we don't know of mechanisms that would produce this kind of gravitational wave signal that aren't inflation. And so this, this box here, Sorry, actually, but given like, that when for, for, yeah, for okay, this, this, yeah, okay, sorry, sorry, okay, go ahead. I'll let you finish. Okay. Yeah, maybe this is getting too baroque, but but okay. the question is, is like, you see, gravi if you know that inflation happens and you see gravitational waves, then that makes you happy. Right. If you don't see gravitational waves, then you have to say, well, as a theorist, do I now convince myself that probably inflation can happen? And you rule out the simplest models of inflation, but but there are lots of, there's no reason to think that inflation happens for simple reasons. So maybe, mm. you, maybe it's all right. If you don't see gravitational waves and inflation doesn't happen, then that doesn't necessarily tell you anything. But it, but it, you know, it's a completely viable hmm. thing. So the the search for this gravitational wave background was seen you know, it's described as a smoking gun for inflation. But if you, you know, you can get plenty of cases where someone's killed someone and there's no smoking gun, and you know, you have to, hmm. you know, that the, the jury will convict on the basis of you know all sorts of you know peripheral and circumstantial evidence. But you don't have this kind of really clear, you know, absolutely, you know, A goes to B line of evidence. Whereas in the case of the gravitational wave background, if you had seen, or if you do see the kind of gravitational wave background that people talk about, then then I think it, I think most people would see that as a as a as a validation of the, mm. of the claim so, that sorry, inflation happens I, I, in the early I, universe. Yeah, I guess what I was trying to clarify is it seems that so it, you know inflation implies gravitational waves because we have a model of inflation and then that model gives you gravitational waves. But but the, the experiment is trying to go the other way. So, I mean, I know this is physics, not math, but... but, but yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, right? So, so you're trying to say that, oh, if I find gravitational waves, then it seems that's consistent with inflation. But what, what I was a little confused about is that if you find gravitational waves, it seems like there are many ways you could arrive at it without inflation, uh, right? Like it could, uh, they, could just, they could just exist for whatever reason, not having to do anything um, with inflation. So, so the right? key thing would be saying it's not just gravitational waves in general because we know that they're out there. Okay. But it's this particular kind of gravitational wave that seems to exist at all scales in the universe. Got it. And so, so, right. so, like stretched all the way from one side of the sky to the other. Got it. As well as particularly on solar system scales. Okay. So conspiratorial and gravitational waves. You've got, yeah. and, and then you're going back to this near exponential phase of expansion, where you're continuously producing gravitational waves. The universe is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but its density is not changing very much. And so that means that you're producing yeah. this. You know, the gravitational waves that you produce, even though they're wildly separated in terms of their, um, their, their physical size, their underlying amplitude is essentially the same as each other. Okay. And, and, and so it's that, it's, you're not just looking for like, oh, yes, we found a gravitational wave that proved that inflation happened. Is you're seeing a very specific Got it. Uh, background that of makes gravitational sense. waves that, 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 that extends all the way out to the, you know, the longest visible wavelengths in the universe today. And, and that, it's very hard to imagine an alternative mechanism that would that would produce something that had the same set of properties. Got it. Okay. So maybe yeah. So to wrap the story up. So what what exactly uh, was Bicep two trying to do in this regard? Was it the was it the first uh, to try to do this kind of experiment? No, lots of people had looked at, at the pol So you're looking at the polarization of the microwave background. So you know the the, the you know the photons have you know the E field lines up you know slightly more in one direction than the other. Um, and so it wasn't the first, but it was a much more sensitive experiment to polarization um, than people had previously run. It was based; it is based at the South Pole, so it's a telescope mm. that By operates. Way, is this is this polarization due to the gravitational waves, or is this like a separate phenomenon? So the polarization is in the microwave background, mm -hmm. and if you took the gravitational waves out of the universe, then the polarization, particular polarization pattern that you saw, wouldn't be there. Okay. So the polar, so you're seeing like additional polarization over and above what you might have expected for other reasons. And, I see. Okay. And, and this quite distinctive pattern that has this kind of circular, you know, if you plot it on the sky, it looks like the arrows are kind of you know, kind of form this kind of circular pattern. I see. So, and so this, okay. so that, so bicep two was much more sensitive to polarization and was a much, you know, was like a had new detector technology that made it a, just a better way to measure the microwave background that sorry, people sorry, have tried previously. Sorry, sorry. So so we already have this polarization in the CMB. Bicep 2 was trying to find a, a, a more sensitive measurement of that that would go beyond... Uh... Yeah, so, so the, there's polarization for complicated reasons due to gravitational lensing. Um, there's polarization in a, a, a kind of linear polarization pattern that arises oh, naturally for other reasons. So it's like you take the polarization pattern on the sky and then you, you 
you see something that has this kind of circular component to it. Or if you, I mean, another way to think, if you reflect it in a mirror, then the pattern changes. Whereas if you take the other kind, if you reflect it in a mirror that doesn't, your one's parity odd, any other one's parity even. Um, and so, so people had previously detected polarization in the sky that 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 had happened. Um, what hadn't happened was detection of this particular circular polarization. I see, pattern. and that requires that, more that, fine fine grain experiments. Fine grain experiments, and also the ability to image a, rel a relatively large chunk of the sky at the same time, because because of the, the angular size of the pattern that they were looking. For. Got it. Got it. Okay. So 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 okay. So I think this is I, th I think this is all. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, okay. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I see. And then and then uh, of course the, the 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 large part of the the the, the affair and, and of course Brian Keating's book is the fact that uh, there was an initial uh, uh, belief in a success full outcome but then it was invalidated subsequently because uh, well, they could not pretty quickly it fell yeah. apart i guess yeah because they because they so I, I forget the logic but basically they couldn't rule it apart from dust right so so it turns out that if you have dust in the milky way galaxy that is electrically charged it lines itself up with the magnetic field i think this is i think this is the right line of logic okay. it lines itself up with the magnetic field of the milky way galaxy and it superimposes a similar pattern on the on the sky except it's like we're just looking you know this is just kind of schwarz on the window and we, we're looking out into deep space and so the amount of dust that they thought existed in these maps was what turned out to be more than they thought it was um and so their guess as to how much dust there was 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 too conservative and so this the, the, they absolutely saw the signal that they saw and their ability to measure the sky is in fact way better was like a huge advance on what had been done in the past but the origin of the signal that they attributed to micro and to the to this inflationary signal was in fact attributed to to, to dust that they hadn't um you know whose contribution they hadn't subtracted from the sky and the particular thing that they had is that the original measurement was only done in one wavelength and if you the the, the spectrum of the microwave background, the Planck curve is different from the spectrum that we get from radiation from dust. And so if you had measurements in several frequency bands, you would have been able to do a better job of, um, of subtracting the dust signal. And that initial point, they didn't, but they, they had reason to be optimistic that the level of signal from the dust was lower than it turned out to be. But it turns it turns out that, that that optimism was misplaced. I see, so just maybe just a caricature. So, so there's sort of like, there's this polarization that you're looking for uh, due to gravitational waves. And then the question is, which part of this is uh, due to CMB uh, plus dust? And if you ignore, if you ignore this term, then you think, so, so you find this positive signal and you think, and if you think it's all due to CMB, you, you know, you get a Nobel prize, but unfortunately you forgot the dust term. And then you realize, oh, it's actually all the, so, so it's a logic that, oh, it's actually all the dust and there's nothing from the CMB because you, now you add in this term and therefore uh, it removes it all from yeah, the Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's I, I a think. sad truth. And, okay. and if you'd been able, if you'd had like a color map of the, of the microwave background, you would have been able to, to disentangle the dust signal better from the, um, from the polarization signal. And mm. I, mean, I, I mean, I remember like the, the word kind of broke a few days ahead of time that they were going to make this announcement. And I remember I was actually Skyping with a with a colleague in in London and she'd said something oh I've just heard this crazy rumor that you know that they're going to announce like a, a microwave back you know like a detection of you know a b mode we call it or tensors um you know with r which is the amp number we use to parameterize its amplitude r of 0.2 which we already thought was ruled out for other reasons and I said, oh, I hadn't heard that, but it's, you know, it sounds, sounds crazy, but it would be cool if it was true. And while we were having that conversation, I got an email from a journalist um, who, who was on the story and it kind of emailed me and said, I've just heard this, this rumor that there's going to be an announcement next week saying that R is 0.2. And I was like, uh, so I said to, you know, said to my colleague in London, oh, you know, like, like I thought I was, you know, you were on the inside, you know, like like I was kind of outside of the, you know, not A-list enough to get this rumor. Well, it turns out it's, it's just arrived, you know. And so there was like, there's just this huge frenzy inside of the cosmology community that, that, um, that you know, that, this, that the signal had been found, that, that the idea of inflation had been validated, that the inflationary model that produced it had to be something kind of wacky in some sense in order to get the signal that actually as big as it was um and just 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 this huge amount of of, of you know sort of 
um, you know, sense that we'd, we'd had this, you know, we're living through this kind of moment where people had made this kind of epochal discovery. And then actually, I mean, it unraveled pretty quickly once the, once the work was released. Um, you know, there were a couple of people who were able to look at it and sort of reconstruct what they'd done and say, actually, you know, there's, there's, there's more risk here mm. than, you, than you probably realize. <laughs> that you, should, mm, you, know, you should be careful. <laughs> yeah, so, so it came out and stuck for them pretty early, but there was a scene, there was this kind of week or a couple of weeks where, where you thought that like, we, we, know, we know how the universe began. We know what energy the physics, you know, that control this process must have been at, um, you know, it's a trillion times you know, higher than anything we can reach on the ground. And, and, and we've now got this kind of picture of the universe that goes all, almost all the way back to the Big Bang, you know, a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang that, that, um, that has been validated by this experiment. And, and that's, that's a very exciting mm. place for everyone to be living, but was obviously a particularly exciting place for the for the Bicep 2 team to be living. Sure, I see, I see, I see. <laughs> well, well, uh, well, of course, uh, you know, the, the people who want to know how, more about that story can, of course, read uh, read uh, Brian Keating's uh, book. Um, maybe we should end on a on a, a, a on a positive uh, note. Uh, I, I would end on one actually well, before we okay. oh. positive note. Okay. The Bicep team is still working. I mean, the, the latest results they've got are actually a, a uh, up and now a much tighter limit on any tensor signal. So they've kind of gone in the opposite direction. They've got the, easily the tightest bounds on, on this gravitational wave signal uh, coming from the Bicep telescope and also a, the Keck telescope, which is, I think, likewise located at the South Pole. Oh, really? So, 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 so they've actually pivoted to like saying, oh, yeah, actually the tightest constraints on the signal are still coming from these guys. Oh. Beautiful technology, but, but, and are putting real constraints on the inflationary parameter space so they've you know the, the work continues and and oh wow you know absolutely driving progress in the field okay okay so this is not a just a, a one and done failure it's actually it's it's still they're still bootstrapping from what they were doing and 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 from a technical from a purely technical perspective they're the, whatever what everything that they've done is beautiful they've got these lovely um you know, fancy bolometric sensors um you know they're they're, they're you know, they've, they've got, you know, every year, they, well, most years they, they take, you know, more data at the, at the South Pole Observatory. So from that point of view, it's just this lovely work. The, the issue was, is that there was this, I, I guess, a sort of rush to judgment about, um, you know, this, this, this particular result and this kind of unknown that they thought they had under control, or at least was kind of like sufficiently small that it would, that it, you know, they wouldn't completely ruin it. And, and, and that they found out was obviously not the case, but mm -hmm. from, from a technical perspective, the 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 um, the the, you know, the bicep two has gone from or bicep the bicep observatory has gone from strength to strength. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah. Okay. So maybe maybe this is a good a uh, 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 time to to wrap this up. Uh, so what's what's um, what's going on today? Let's fast forward to today. What's what's going on in cosmology? <laughs> what's hot? What's what's the future? Are we is, is cosmology in a in a good state, a bad state? Uh, <laughs> what should we be looking for? I mean, this, <laughs> Okay, no, there's a, there's a bunch of things to look for. And um, the first thing is is that um, there's what they call the Hubble tension. So we think we we thought we knew how fast the universe was expanding, which is this a dot over a, or what we call. I mean, that Hubble's constant. You know, like a galaxy that's twice as far away is expanding twice as fast. But what is the you know? So that gives you a kind of a linear relationship. But what is a proportionality constant? Then Hubble's constant. And so when I was a kid, the argument was, and some city units said it was 50 or 100, and they were like two team or two kind of groupings of people, and they didn't really overlap. And so slowly those numbers have moved to the point where it looked like it was about 70, and everyone could agree on that, um, you know, which is sort of splitting the difference. And that's partly driven by the discovery that the universe is ex expanding at an accelerated rate because of dark energy. But now it seems like there's a bunch of people who are based around experiments that use the microwave background that say that this number is 66. And there's another bunch of people who are based around primarily supernovae and Cepheid variables that say that it's about 74 or 75. And the error bars on those two numbers are now at the point where they don't really overlap with each other at all. And so explaining why that is, is definitely a fun, is, that's either we don't understand one set of measurements as well as we should, which is possible, or there's something new about the expansion of the universe that we haven't properly taken into account. So that 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 that's absolutely worth a watch. Um, the other things that there's next generation experiments that will probe 
the distribution of dark matter in the universe, the properties of dark matter, the distribution of dark or the properties of dark energy. They put more and more, more and more constraints actually on this inflationary gravitational wave background. And there's a, a range of big experiments being deployed in the next decade. So the Vera Rubin Observatory and the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, uh, the Euclid Satellite, um, uh, DESI, the a kind of spectroscopic survey of galaxies. There's a variety of things that when you add them together, a radio telescope called CHIME in Canada is looking at um, gas or the distribution of hydrogen gas and figuring out you know, the inhomogeneity in that, you know, how the matter is distributed and di distributed in the universe. And all of those things together are going to give us a much, much tighter bite on the kinds of, you know, on the, our ability to measure the behavior of the universe and to then really test models of, you know, how it is that galaxies form um, you know, how that relates to the properties of dark matter, you know, what the dark matter might actually be. And so there's, there's going to be just this torrent of data that's going to arrive in the next decade that we, we have to, as theorists, that we're kind of looking forward to, to being able to, able to make use of. And then in the longer term, uh, we can make use of gravitational waves um, from next generation gravitational wave observatories will tell us things about the universe as a whole, which, which um, again, potentially changes the game for us in, in a variety of ways. So cosmology has gone from being this, um, you know, science where things were uncertain by factors of two or more to being, you know, where we're worried about sort of 1% level measurements and we can, you know, test the theories with, a, with according precision. So that's where we're at. And yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating time to be alive. Well, that's, that's great. Uh, wow. I, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, diff, different, uh, different scientific fields operate by different norms and, and and resources and and i i'd never thought about the fact that astronomy uh, used to be a field where factor a factor of two was a good margin of error you know me being a, yeah, yeah. a, a mathematician and now pi is the same number. yeah right <laughs> being a being a first a pure mathematician and now someone working in, in, in the computer science world a factor of two is, is you know unacceptable so <laughs> so but uh, no, it's, it's, it's gone from being like a total calculation oftentimes to being able you know to, to really needing to to tackle it computationally as well so the the rise of computational astrophysics is obviously partly driven by the ability just to do computation mm -hmm. but also the necessity for computational astrophysics is driven by the fact that you want a number that's a you know one percent number not a ten percent number or an order of magnitude number which might have been enough you know and in the 1970s an order of magnitude was enough 1990s maybe ten percent was enough and you know now we really want you know, sort of one percent numbers to say you can test um, general relativity against other theories of gravity from the way that structure forms in the universe on the very largest scales but to do that you've got to have everything under control to, to, to very very you know high levels of precision and so then that both in terms of the data handling and also in terms of the theoretical models that you're matching them requires just just hugely more sophistication than it was the case even, even a decade ago hmm. Okay. Well, great. Uh, this has been really fun, Richard. And, and uh, yeah, thanks a lot for your time. And this no, this thank you for learned so me, much. Thank you for having me as an early guest. And I, I, hope, yeah, I hope this is a, a, the first or the second of a very, you know, of a long line of successful discussions. It's, it's been really fun and I've enjoyed it a lot. So thank you. For, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thanks. This was a lot of fun.